Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from the Stockton Center for International Law at the U.S. Naval War College. We welcome you to day three, the final day of the Alexander C. Cushing International Law Conference. I'm Commander Michael Petta. I'm the Associate Director for Maritime Operations here at the Stockton Center, and I will be your MC for today. On day one of the conference, we heard from eight U.S. military officers and learned about their unique perspectives of matters related to the Indo-Pacific region. On day two of the conference, we heard about naval forces developments in that same area from the Senkekus to Diego Garcia. Today, we will look a little more broadly at issues not unique to the Indo-Pacific region. We have, not, we have four panels today, panel uh, four sessions, I apologize, sessions nine through 12. And uh, session nine, we will discuss climate change. Session 10, we will address the Arctic. Session 11, we will discuss illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, often referred to as IUU fishing. And then to close out the day in session 12, we will hear from the U.S. Coast Guard's Judge Advocate General, Melissa Burt. Before setting off in uh, that direction, I'd like to offer a few reminders to the audience. First, the chat feature is disabled in Zoom today. We encourage you to submit questions and upvote questions using the Q&A feature. Also, Zoom has a closed caption option. So if you would like a live transcript of today's speakers, you can activate that live transcript at the bottom right portion of the Zoom application. To reserve time for discussion today, we will keep our expert introductions relatively brief. And if you would like to learn more about our speakers' distinguished careers and expertise, you can find that in their biographical information in the online conference program. We will post a link to the conference program in the chat feature for your convenience. Session nine is entitled Climate Change and National Security. This discussion will be moderated by Professor Mark Nevitt, Syracuse University College of Law. Before we turn to Mark, the Honorable Sherry Goodman, presently of the Wilson Center and formerly the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security will set the stage. Deputy Undersecretary Goodman, I turn the floor over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you, Commander Petta, and all of the audience. Oh, let's see my video. Uh, okay. Can you see me now? There we go. Good morning, everyone. It's a, uh, our evening, wherever you're joining us from. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Stockton Center uh, at the U.S. Naval War College for inviting me to join you and to Mark Nevitt uh, for taking the initiative for organizing this event. And you've all certainly chosen a timely moment to convene a conference on the Indo-Pacific and national security. The Indo-Pacific is witnessing major geostrategic shifts. China's flexing both its economic and military muscles to expand its influence globally. India is struggling with the worst COVID outbreak of any nation in the region while contending with security issues internally and along its border with China. Across the region, countries are navigating the twin challenges of building a post-pandemic new normal while addressing looming environmental and resource competition that will be a defining feature of interstate relations for coming decades. Climate change is exacerbating these issues. Severe weather impacts, the systems of transport and power infrastructure essential for modern life. It threatens livelihoods in traditional industries like agriculture or fishing that are foundational to Indo-Pacific economies, and it heightens the risk of pandemics and novel pathogens. And it can make scarce resources scarcer, scarcer, ethnic tensions more severe, competition for resources in the global economy more pronounced, and societies less governable. I'll highlight some examples shortly. Let's start with climate change also posits specific threats to militaries. This is not news to the U.S. Navy, um, but it's worth identifying three strands of climate security threats facing the United States military and its allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific. First, 
Climate change harms operational readiness by damaging military ports, airports, infrastructure and equipment, or by impairing the physical ability of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to perform their duties. Second, it induces a surge in demand for humanitarian assistance and disaster response, HADR missions. Finally, climate change is a threat multiplier, a term I coined back in 2007 when I founded the CNA Military Advisory Board. And uh, we found that it amplifies underlying tensions and acts as a catalyst for conflict. For these reasons, I am an advocate of climatizing security, taking action to anticipate or prevent or prepare for climate related threats to security, while also leading the charge on the energy transition. To illustrate this approach to the issue, I'd like to take you on a quick climate security tour of the region. We'll zoom in on competition over shared water basins and resources in the global commons in Southeast Asia, internal migration, and a standoff between nuclear powers in South Asia, and nature-based perils and adversarial aggression in the Arctic. These examples should be sufficient to inform a discussion on options for better managing the climate security landscape of the future. First, let's start in Southeast Asia. Many of the region's endemic security threats are being exacerbated by climate change. Geopolitical tensions with China are on the rise in the region. Chief among them are contested maritime boundaries and competition for ocean-based resources like fish and hydrocarbons. On land, excessive heat and drought, particularly in rural agricultural areas, induces migration to coastal cities, which are themselves at risk from storms and inundation. Domestic insurgent groups and violent extremist organizations are recruiting farmers and fishermen no longer able to make a living. Fishermen adept at making bombs for blast fishing, the practice of stunning fish with an underwater explosion then capturing them with a net, are particularly attractive recruits. These threat amplifiers added to the physical damage wrought by climate impacts are stunting economic growth and impairing the ability of governments to provide basic services compromising stability and sec security. Let's focus first on the South China Sea, uh, something I know you're all uh, familiar with and interested in. Territorial claims in the South China Sea look a bit like a football coach's game plan. There are red and blue lines crisscrossing all over the map. The most troubling is China's nine dash line, a U-shaped line drawn by 1940s Chinese cartographer encompassing up to 90% of the sea. Much of the claim is contrary to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Nonetheless, China has been actively solidifying its control of sea lines of communication by building airstrips, ports, and sensor arrays on contested islands and marine features. These assets then serve as a base of operations for the Chinese military and Coast Guard. Interestingly, China, Chinese action is driven in part by climate change. The resources they claim include subsea minerals necessary for the renewable energy transition. They also include rich deposits of oil and gas. An estimated two years of oil and 17 years of gas at Chinese consumption rates, which should arguably stay in the ground to avoid more dangerous climate change. China has forcibly blocked Malaysia, the Philippines, and Vietnam from oil and gas exploration while initiating its own causing consternation among the ASEAN nations are, that ASEAN nations are struggling to address. Southeast Asia is home to about 9% of the global population, but 18% of the global fish catch. Overfishing and warmer, more acidic oceans are taking a toll on both historically rich fishing grounds and traditional livelihoods supporting millions. Small local fishing boats forced to sail farther from land are confronted with armed Chinese vessels. In September 2020, the Chinese Coast Guard reported that over the course of the preceding four months, it had evicted over 1,100 fishing boats from the northern half of the South China Sea while detaining 11 vessels and over 60 foreign crew members. The confluence of dwindling stocks and being treated like pawns in a geostrategic game puts undue pressure on Southeast Asian fishermen and calls into question ASEAN's ability to manage conflict in a unified productive manner. China's maritime activity is underpinned by a new Chinese Coast Guard law, which went into effect in February. It authorizes its maritime fleets to use lethal force on foreign ships operating in Chinese waters. Several Southeast Asian and East Asian countries have expressed concern about this law, including Taiwan and Japan. As with other disputes in the South China Sea, no legal or institutional recourse exists to resolve such completing claims. Shared river basins. Contests over water are not limited to the open seas. 
A case in point and frequently in the news is the Mekong River. The Mekong originates in China, then flows through Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, and Vietnam, supporting a population of 60 million. And if you've ever been down there, as I have, you really feel like you're a you know, like you're about to be flooded every moment you're on that river. Rivering geography often favors upstream actors and China has taken advantage of its position to build a series of dams in part to meet its climate targets. Thus, when water levels in the Mekong plunged 90% in late 2019 and early 2020, prompting emergency action in Vietnam and Thailand, eyes turned to China. China demurred, citing natural causes, but a U.S. state Department funded project by the nonprofit Eyes on Earth revealed that the missing water corresponded to the reserve capacity of 11 major dams built upstream by a Chinese state owned enterprise cited for poor environmental and social performance. This and preceding examples illustrate what is often missing in resource conflicts a trusted source of data and an institutional capacity to manage dispute resolution. The cross-border nature of climate change and the crescendo of competition for scarce resources demonstrate the need for both better data and more robust institutions for diplomacy. Next, let's move to South Asia. This region's geography makes it particularly vulnerable to climate change. What is less appreciated is the impact of climactic change on security and stability, both within and between states. The impact of climate change on internal stability in South Asia is hard to overstate. The subregion's population of almost 2 billion was already confronting endemic poverty, poor governance, water stress, and energy inequality before COVID-19 hit. Lower on the development ladder than Southeast Asia, South Asian nations still struggle to provide basic services, including energy, water, sanitation, healthcare, and adequate food security. Temperatures are soaring, exacerbating some of the most dangerous air pollution in the world. Rural agricultural families are being exposed to heat that is simply not supportable by the human body absent air conditioning. And with air conditioning penetration at only about 10%, there is nowhere for most people to escape. Farmers are abandoning their drought plagued lands for for proverbial and literal greener pastures, but that's no easy feat. Migrants crossing the boundaries of India's federal states also across ethnic lines run the risk of being perceived as competition for jobs and living space. With climate force migration reaching almost 25 million in 2019 and projected to surge to 63 million by 2050 in one recent study, the precursors for conflict and fragility are already sown. Climate factors are also consequential in the tense relations between nuclear-armed India, Pakistan, and China. A study published last week jointly by the Council on Strategic Risks and the Woodwell Climate Research Center projects a strong warming trend near the disputed India-China border, where approximately 100,000 Indian and Chinese troops are deployed at altitudes reaching 15,000 feet. Military patrols are which are not viable today, may become more frequent, setting the conditions for more violent clashes while concurrently increasing the likelihood of deadly avalanches. Meanwhile, China, partly due to its transition to renewable energy, is planning the world's largest hydroelectric facility just north of where the Brahmaputra enters India. Three times the size of the Three Gorges Dam, this dam project is also located in a seismically sensitive zone. This has caused major concern in downstream India, which is also worried that the new Chinese dam could withhold or flood its adjacent adjacent regions with water. In truth, it will be difficult to tell if a future flood is the result of Chinese manipulation or simply climate factors. Though a major earthquake could be induced by a massive Chinese dam, causing it to fracture and cause a major flood, Chinese lack of transparency on the dam projects affecting its neighbors only increases India's mistrust. China is also constructing a series of dams in Pakistani-held Kashmir, which India objects to due to its territorial claims there. The recent climate security study shows that these dams, when built, will be viable until the end of the century due to glacial melt patterns maintaining a good flow in the Indus River. This will contribute to further strengthening the China-Pakistan partnership, a sore point with India, In all these disputes, universally trusted data sources and institutions capable of managing disputes are lacking. Well, now let's move north. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And it's very timely. Today is the uh, Arctic Council, today, tomorrow, 
is the Arctic Council meeting. Our Secretary of State Blinken will be in Iceland for that and uh, meeting uh, his Russian counterpart for the first time and addressing Arctic and climate issues there. Warming there has, cas has cascading effects throughout the region. At the same time, Indo-Pacific countries are increasingly active in the no far north in shipping, oil and gas exploration, and militarization of newly accessible sea channels. NOAA's 2020 Arctic report card showed that the Arctic has already warmed almost two degrees centigrade. High temperatures induced massive wildfires in Alaska, Russia, and elsewhere in 2019, adding substantially to global emissions and accelerating permafrost thaw. Permafrost thaw unleashes multiple irreversible threats to stability in a delicate but rapidly changing region. First among these is destabilization of existing infrastructure, including aging U.S. military installations, radar stations, and National Guard posts in Alaska and Greenland. I recommend checking out a visual story map and accompanying report published uh, just today or maybe yesterday by the Council on Strategic Risks and the Woodwell Climate Research Center for a glimpse of what's ahead. Dangerous subsidence already threatens residential, industrial, and oil and gas infrastructure across the region with an estimated cumulative price tag of $66 trillion globally on current trajectories. This figure does not include the release of novel pathogens released from the frozen remains of humans and animals. Indeed, the recent release of amoeba infecting viruses in Siberia are believed to be the result of thawing permafrost. Transmission of novel or eradicated pathogens portends serious worldwide health security consequences. Viewed in the context of increased mobility and commercial activity in the region, as well as the destabilization risks to local sanitation infrastructure, these high impact but low probability health risks become more likely and more serious. Human activity is also heating up. Mineral, gas, and oil exploration, shipping routes, research activities, fishing, and tourism have all migrated north in recent years. Russia in particular is promoting the Northern Sea Route as a toll road for transit, a shipping lane offering state-sponsored icebreakers and incentives for cargo. Russia is also aggressively pursuing hydrocarbon development across the Beaufort, Norwegian, and Chukchi Sea, thought to contain 30% of the world's undiscovered recoverable gas reserves and 13% of its undiscovered oil reserves. Asian companies and Chinese state companies are also developing oil and gas extraction infrastructure in this region and building out military operations in support. Indeed, uh, China has declared its uh, first Arctic policy several years ago, is connecting a polar silk road around the region and has significant ambitions as well. The size, scope, and uncertain safety procedures being used for resource extraction pose concerning security risks, particularly the likelihood of onshore or offshore spills or collisions among vessels in the region. Um, and I direct you to a, um, uh, a tabletop exercise report we did with the National Academy of Sciences, the Wilson Center and Sandia National Lab several years ago, looking at a um, nuclear incident in the Bering Strait uh, between a hypothetical Russian nuclear icebreaker and a Chinese LNG vessel in 2050. Okay, this brings us to the need to address climate gaps in international legal relief regimes, all you lawyers out there. And I'll confess myself, I'm a recovering lawyer. Okay, the South China Sea conflicts in particular highlight the critical role that islands and maritime features play in the definition of sovereignty and ocean resource rights. As such islands and features are submerged by rising seas, nations like Indonesia and the Pacific Island states stand to lose significant portions of their exclusive economic zones and associated use of marine resources, including energy and mineral deposits. This development opens the door for developed nations to offer island building expertise in exchange for access to the EEZ of less developed geographically dispersed island nations. Such agreements could vastly expand the influence of the developed nations and alter the strategic landscape substantially. A second issue arises when developed nations exercise their island building capabilities inside the EEZ of other nations. The law of the sea excludes features that cannot sustain life from the calculation of territorial rights. China's deliberate development and extension of islets within the Spratlys potentially changes their status under the framework of the law at a moment when contested territories are likely to become even more strategically significant for access to fish, energy resources, and sea lines of communication. 
Turning down the heat will require a systematic integration of climate factors into security analysis, planning, and operations, as well as across broader government functions. Both climate change and geopolitical dynamics are developing with incredible speed. The U.S. and partner militaries need to act just as quickly. The first step must be data-based analysis of how future climate projections will affect existing and probable security risks throughout the region, including secondary and tertiary effects. Such analyses should be repeated with each relative, relevant scientific advance to maintain full situational awareness and accord planning. Second, climate security considerations should be shared across government departments to inform diplomatic, energy, commercial, and trade policy decisions. Military and security actors can be effective advocates in support of the transition to low carbon energy, something which is lacking in the region today. Third, regional governments should invest in trusted granular real-time data where climate sensitive geographies and fragile security situations overlap. This data can form the basis for a new era of data diplomacy, especially where transparency can curb the actions of regional aggressors. Fourth, governments should consider how to leverage existing diplomatic forums like ASEAN and the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation to elevate and mainstream climate security issues. These institutions will need to evolve in both scope and institutional robustness to take on the mounting challenges. Um, and fifth, the U.S. and its regional partner militaries should step up their game in climate security preparedness. This, that means you guys. This means moving beyond reactive HADR operations to incorporate anticipatory intelligence gathering, analysis planning and operations to combat the threat multiplier effect of a warming planet. The existing Pacific Environmental Security Forum organized by US PACOM, as well as other Pacific Naval gatherings could be helpful means to advance such initiatives. And finally, at the global level, Foundational laws like UNCLOS should be updated to account for technical and climate re related realities to, of today. It goes without saying that, of course, the U.S. should ratify this law. We've been saying that for decades. Uh, hopefully it will happen within our lifetimes. Uh, that brings us back to where we started in closing. The Indo-Pacific will continue to face complex geostrategic shifts. Those related to climate change can be better predicted, predicted anticipated, and addressed taking rapid action to do so systematically and in coordination with allied and partner nations is the best strategy for ensuring a stable transition to a lower carbon, lower conflict world. We can better secure the Indo-Pacific region, work with our allies and partners by taking steps now to climate-proof our security for the future. Thank you very much. Great, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Ms. Goodman, for those, those key mar keynote remarks. And let me just note that, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Goodman, you've been thinking about climate security for a long time, and you are a true trailblazer in, in this area. Uh, so thank you so much for your keynote remarks, which sets up our panel here today very well. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Mark Nett. I'm a former Naval officer, JAG. I am a somewhat of a recovering attorney although I'm still a law professor at the Syracuse University College of Law, where I'm writing and researching in the areas of climate change, environmental law, and national security law. And I'm moderating today's panel on climate change and national security, where I'm joined by three of the world's leading experts, and, and Ms. Goodman, your voice is welcome as well. Um, and I want to specifically thank uh, Professor James Kraska at the Naval War College for the invitation and Commander uh, Mike Petta, who does all the administrative work behind the scenes to make this happen. Really, really thank you for your graciousness and your generosity. I think it's appropriate that we're having this panel discussion on climate change and national security. One of the first scholarly papers on this topic entitled Global Climate Change, Implications for the United States Navy, was drafted right here at the Naval War College back in 19. 90. And it said, and I quote, naval operations will be drastically affected by global climate change, and we need resources of both mind and money to tackle the growing problem of climate change. So we may not have the money, but we certainly have the best minds here in the War College. And I would submit since 1990, this topic has only grown in importance. Uh, our three panelists, their bios are in the program. Let me just highlight a couple aspects of these wonderful uh, esteemed scholars. 
First, uh, Professor Daniel Badansky is the Regents Professor of Law at Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Arizona State University. Uh, he's been thinking deeply about international law governance and climate governance for 30 plus years and just wrote the, I, I believe, that the best international legal governance on this topic entitled International Climate Change Law with Oxford Press. Second, Alice Hill uh, is the David Rubenstein Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council of Foreign Relations. She has deep, deep experience uh, on this topic, serving as a special assistant uh, to President uh, Barack Obama and Senior Director for Resilience Policy and the National Security staff. We had a chance to work briefly together, though she was way, way, way above the chain of command when I was in Hampton Roads, Virginia, when I was in the Navy, working on a sea level rise uh, pilot project during that time about seven years ago. She's also the author of this book, Building a Resilient Tomorrow, which is mandatory reading for everyone here on this panel. Uh, and last but not least is, is Professor Karen Scott, who's joining us from from New Zealand, which I believe might be three o'clock in the morning, uh, which shows the dedication to this topic. So special thanks to you, Professor Scott. Uh, professor Scott is a professor of law at the University of Canterbury, and she too has wrote, written extensively about international law, environmental law, climate change law, and I'm looking to bring her voice on Indo-Pacific in particular to this conversation. Uh, I've asked each panelist, uh, starting with Professor Bodansky, to give their opening remarks based upon their respective areas of expertise. And so I'd like to turn the floor over to Professor Bodansky for his uh, remarks, and then we'll go to uh, Ms. Hill and then Professor Scott before going to Q&A. And for those participants out there in the cyber world, don't be shy on the Q&A. Uh, uh, we only have an hour to tackle this crisis. <laughs> we'll get there, but uh, please do get your comments and questions in uh, the Q&A function, and we'll do our best to, to get to those. So without further ado, Professor Badansky. Well, great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that kind uh, in, uh, introduction. And thanks to the Stockton Center for inviting me to participate. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, in these very brief opening remarks, I'm gonna describe the climate change regime, give an overview of it, and then uh, discuss uh, some climate security uh, interactions and the role of the regime in addressing those. Uh, there are many um, climate security interactions, and uh, Ms. Goodman did a great job uh, uh, going over them. Uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, climate change will have big impacts on the military. It's a threat multiplier. As she said, it's uh, affect military missions. Uh, it will affect military operations. And then on the other hand, uh, the causal error also runs in the other direction. The military itself contributes to climate change through its emissions. <laughs> climate change regime um, has been a uh, international forum to address climate change since its establishment um, almost three decades ago. This slide shows some of the key events, including the adoption of the UN Framework Convention in 1992, which established the basic system of governance, uh, the adoption of the Kyoto Protocol five years later, which imposed legally binding limits on emissions of developed countries, <clears throat> the adoption of the Copenhagen Accord in 2009, which established a more global approach, and I think really laid the foundation for the Paris Agreement, uh, the adoption of the Paris Agreement in 2015, and then three years later, the Paris Rule Book, which sets forth the detailed rules for how the Paris Agreement are gonna work. The Paris Agreement is the focal point of climate action today, and I think it's important here to distinguish between two Parises. First, there's the Paris Agreement, strictly speaking, and second, there's the wider Paris process, which includes discussions of climate change in other multilateral forum uh, and by non-governmental groups uh, and by not other non-state actors. The Paris Agreement uh, as an agreement is crucial, but I think it's comparatively modest. It was adopted in 2015 and came into force the following year. Now that the US is rejoined under President Biden and has almost universal participation, what I like to call the Paris paradigm has five uh, elements. First, a bottom-up approach in which states pledge what they're gonna do to address climate change in nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Second, a hybrid legal structure in which the agreement as a whole is legally binding, but not all of its provisions are. Most importantly, there's no legal obligation on parties to achieve their NDCs. Third, a reliance on transparency 
rather than legal bindingness uh, to promote compliance and accountability. Fourth, an ambition cycle to ratchet up the level of ambition over time. The initial round of pledges are clearly insufficient to address the problem, uh, but every five years, the parties are going to be doing a global stock take of their collective progress in addressing climate change, and these then provide the basis for their next round of NDCs, where they pledge what they're going to do in the succeeding years. And then finally, a nuanced approach to differentiation, in which parties have essentially the same obligations, in contrast to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which imposed emission uh, reduction limits on uh, developed countries, but had no new commitments for developing countries such as China, which is now, of course, the world's largest emitter. Supplementing the Paris Agreement is the larger process that the agreement has spawned. And this involves a wide variety of initiatives, including governments, uh, the financial sector, industry, and environmental groups. For example, the Powering Past Coal Coalition uh, is a coalition of national and subnational governments and businesses aiming to phase out existing coal power. The Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative involves companies that manage uh, $37 trillion in assets. Uh, the Mission Possible Partnership brings together more than 400 companies to develop net zero. All of these wider initiatives uh, are aimed at achieving the three objectives of the Paris Agreement, uh, to limit temperature increase to well below two degrees centigrade and to, uh, uh, to uh, pursue efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, to enhance resilience and adaptation, and to align global financial flows with the other two objectives of the agreement. Um, having described the UN climate change regime, I'd like to make four quite general points about the climate security nexus. First, the UN climate change regime itself doesn't say much specifically about security issues. The most important contribution I think it can make to security is to be successful uh, in preventing damage, uh, dangerous climate change. And here the main challenge is to increase the ambition of countries' efforts to reduce emissions, to put them on a pathway uh, to net zero emissions, uh, at least by mid-century. And that's the main goal of the Glasgow Climate Conference, which is upcoming in November. Second, um, highlighting the national security implications of climate change can be a significant spur to greater climate ambition. Uh, at, but I think at least for the foreseeable future, uh, the UN climate change regime itself will remain the locus of international action. What might be the role of the Security Council in this connection in addressing climate change? In theory, uh, the UN Security Council uh, could determine the climate change as a threat to international peace and security, and then that would be the, potentially the basis for mandatory measures to address climate change under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Uh, but this would be the polar opposite of the uh, nationally determined bottom-up approach that I described that's reflected in the UN climate change regime. And I think it's highly unlikely that this kind of approach would be acceptable internationally, at least for countries like the US, uh, which is now pushing climate change uh, in the UN Security Council as an issue. The point of doing so uh, is not as a prelude to Security Council action under Chapter 7 of the Charter, but to highlight the urgency of the problem in order to spur greater ambition. Uh, Third, uh, the uh, <clears throat> military needs to take climate change into account in its planning to the extent it's not doing so already. And I think this was covered extremely well in Ms. Goodman's uh, keynote address. It needs to consider climate change in anticipating future conflicts. It needs to anticipate the greater demands that are going to be put on it by climate-induced disasters, uh, for example, flooding of coastal areas, uh, destruction caused by extreme weather events, famines due to drought. Um, and it needs to take uh, climate change into effect, the effects of climate change uh, into account uh, on its basis and uh, readiness. Finally, uh, the Security Council, uh, the military itself, uh, needs to reduce its own contribution to climate change. Uh, emissions by the U.S. military alone are greater uh, than those of many countries. So the military needs to do what it can to reduce its climate footprint. Uh, so that concludes my opening remarks and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Professor Bedansky. Uh, Judge Hill? Hello. Uh, oh, here we go. I'm allowed to start my video now. Thanks. 
Well, what a pleasure uh, to join this stellar panel uh, to hear from Sherry, who has been at the forefront of this work. Mark, it's nice to be reconnected uh, in our different roles. And I look forward to the other panelists. I haven't met them, but uh, Professor Podonsky, I've already uh, learned a great deal. So in 2008, in November 2008, my telephone rang. And on the other end uh, was Janet Napolitano. And here I'll just add a quick aside. My career advice for everyone is be nice to those you sit next to in school. I had sat next to Janet Napolitano in law school. Uh, and she had just been uh, asked to serve as the Secretary of Homeland Security. I was then a judge on the Los Angeles Superior Court. Uh, and I decided to accept the offer and I moved to Washington. One of my very first assignments was to work on climate change. And the reason the assignment fell to me is not because I knew a great deal about climate change. In fact, I'd heard the warnings from the 1990s and uh, onward. Uh, and I had assumed, frankly, that uh, two degrees didn't mean much. I lived in Los Angeles. The temperature toggled between two degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't re realize it was two degrees Celsius. Uh, and I just did not appreciate that this would have significant consequences for the United States and the world. But because I was the new person at the department and because, and this is the topic I want to focus, the reality of working on climate change. At that time, climate change was not viewed as a career enhancing move. In fact, it carried the political connotations it still carries today in a deeply divided and polarized nation with some skepticism as to whether the change is even occurring or what the causes could be. So because I was the new person, as I recall, we're sitting around the conference table with the senior leadership at the Department of Homeland Security and somebody says the body language is very bad about working on an executive order from President Obama to address climate adaptation and mitigation. So somebody said, Oh, give it to her. She's new. And that's, in fact, uh, what happened. So I assembled a task force with uh, members of the military. We learned from U.S. Naval Task Force climate change. We had the Coast Guard, which is a part of DHS. We brought together all the agencies that had been put into the Department of Homeland Security in the wake of 9-11. And, of course, DHS has a deep anti-terrorism focus, but it's also responsible for federal emergency management, the Coast Guard, as well as immigration. And in 2009, the task force in response to the order by President Obama to plan for the climate change impacts, we asked ourselves a question that in hindsight, I think was perhaps somewhat insubordinate to the president's direction, but we asked, should we even care about climate change in 2009, given the, all the other responsibilities and the security responsibilities of the Department of Homeland Security? I think by the end of that task force, virtually every member had realized that the department needed to care deeply about climate change because it would affect virtually every human made system and every natural system because of the warming temperatures. But the reality of working on climate change as we go forward and President Biden certainly has signaled that this is going to be an issue of great focus during his administration on his very first day of office. He indicated that it would be a priority item in both our national security as well as our foreign policy. And through that, uh, he's taken some dramatic steps. He appointed Special Envoy John Kerry, who is known for his deep interest and knowledge in national security and climate change, as Special Envoy for Climate. He has given Special Envoy Kerry a seat at the national security table so that he has a voice in the making of national security policy. He has directed the Department of Defense, as well as the other security agencies, to develop plans to consider climate risks going forward. This is all very important work 
to make sure that we are adequately assessing the impacts that have already occurred and will, that will continue to occur. But we have to recognize that we have a gap in climate literacy. I do not believe that our military or our civilian leaders in our security organizations have any systematic training in the environmental risks posed by climate change and the risks to security. So we need to close that gap. We need to make sure that people are adequately educated and have adequate time to understand the nuanced and complex ways in which changing temperatures, rising temperatures can affect everything from military operations, hurricanes, destroying uh, uh, Air Force bases, sea level rise in Norfolk that will make it difficult for employees to get to work to carry out their military responsibilities, training that has to be cut short because it's either too hot or there's too much wildfire risk. We need to understand these systematically and that means they have to be incorporated and and integrated into decision-making across the board. And that means that we need an educated set of personnel who can do that. And that is a gap that will need to be closed. That is a gap that also exists across the federal government at this point. And we need a plan for how we will make sure that everyone understands what the facts are regarding climate change. We also need to make sure that we have military personnel understanding what the risks are to human security. Sherry has described how this can deeply affect resource competition, can affect access to uh, basic needs, food, water, shelter, livelihoods. As those are threatened, we will see more people migrating. In fact, if you look at our current southern border with the surge of Central Americans from the Northern Triangle, that's from Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala, many of those migrants will tell you they are leaving because of the recent back-to-back -back hurricanes and those hurricanes are likely influenced and made worse by climate change. And then the descent into poverty, chaos and crime, which often accompanies a natural disaster where governments are threatened. We see bad actors, criminal networks, terrorists, use those moments as recruiting opportunities. And we need to understand that so that we can make our own choices about policies to combat those threats going forward. But it has to be a part of the discussion in the room. And today, to date, that has rarely occurred in my experience. In fact, uh, Bob Woodward in his book uh, gave a wonderful anecdote about Richard Holbrook who was then the special envoy for Afghan, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and there was a discussion about security risks in that area. And during the uh, meeting in the Situation Room, uh, Richard Holbrook said, well, there is a component of climate risk here because of the melting glaciers in the Himalayas that cause uh, water to accumulate and then can cause massive downstream flooding, which can then undermine in turn the government. As he was leaving the room, uh, several others that were in the room were overheard to say, are you kidding? What was he talking about? And it was my experience when I was at the White House that climate change was rarely raised as a topic in when there were discussions of security risks, be it in Pakistan, be it in Syria, with 5 million migrants as a, uh, occurring after a 1,200-year drought and mismanagement of water resources. That simply wasn't part of the calculus. That needs to change. When I was at the White House, in response to the lack of focus on this, uh, I led the development of an executive order on national security and climate change, which uh, President Obama signed, President Trump rescinded, and now I'm happy to say President Biden has brought, brought back. But that order is a great start. It means, however, that we need to make sure that we have the proper information and data, as Siri has said, available. And I'll leave you with this last thought. 
As we think about national security and climate change, we need to think about much more than just national security, military might. As one uh, story was related to me by an expert on national security and climate change, he was speaking to a mid-level uh, career officer and the officer very politely said, yes, ma'am, I understand what you're saying, but what hill do I take? And that's not what this will mean for the United States going forward. It's not an issue of necessarily military might. It's figuring out how we will react as human security is increasingly threatened by these events. And then that in turn threatens our national security. So it will mean, uh, as uh, Secretary Mattis recognized when he was under President Trump, that we need to invest in other places to make sure that they can thrive. Because as Secretary Mattis said, if we don't, that just means we'll have to buy more bullets. So we need to change our thinking in terms of recognizing that this is a new way of addressing security. When people's lives are threatened, it can have ramifications for us and our security in the United States. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. It's been uh, really an honor to be asked to join you here today. Great, thank you, Judge Hill. Professor Scott. Good morning. Um, thank you, Professor Nevitt, for your kind words of introduction. And I'd also like to thank the US Naval War College for their kind invitation to speak this morning. Um, I would like to address my remarks this morning to a very particular issue within the broader context of climate change and security. And that issue is sea level rise and its implications for maritime zones and maritime entitlements, the issue which was um, introduced briefly by Deputy Goodman in her introductory keynote this morning. Sea level rise is predicted to, <clears throat> or sea level is predicted to rise by more than a metre by 2100. And although this is likely to have implications for around 70 coastal states, it's island states in the Pacific and to a lesser extent Southeast Asia that are likely to be most at risk. Rising sea levels will typically force the normal baseline, that is the low water line along the coast inland, and base points may be lost, leading to a reduction of maritime zones and a change or loss of entitlements within those zones. This has clear implications for security in terms of resources, the environment, and in the extreme could re risk the very existence of individual island states. The challenge for the law of the sea in responding to this risk is that a conventional interpretation of baselines under the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is that with two exceptions in relation to unstable deltas and the outer continental shelf, baselines are ambulatory, meaning that they move as the coast moves. This reflects the principle of maritime delimitation that the land dominates the sea. Sea level rise therefore has implications for regime security as well as national security. To the extent that the traditional rules are not responding to the needs and demands of states, there is a risk that the law of the sea could be undermined as a regime. There is one partial legal solution to this problem, fairly straightforward, partial because it addresses the stability of maritime zones, but not the situation where the land disappears altogether. And that solution is that states should be able to fix their maritime zones, provided that they've been determined in accordance with international law. Consequently, these maritime zones need not change as the coastline changes. Now, this solution was recommended by the International Law Association in 2018 in their report on international law and sea level rise. And it's received support from quite a number of states, particularly in the context of the Pacific island states. Fixing baselines and or outer limits can be justified on the basis of equity, stability and transparency. It is consistent with a dynamic and evolutionary interpretation of the law of the sea and would also support states obligations in relation to adaptation under the climate change regime, which has been beautifully outlined this morning by Professor Badansky. The Pacific and to a lesser extent Southeast Asia is notable in that states within this region are increasingly fixing their maritime boundaries in legislation or by the use of physical means. 
In the Pacific in particular, there's also been significant institutional support for this practice, with declarations being issued by a number of regional institutions, including the Pacific Islands Forum, the Polynesian Leaders Group, and States Party to the Nauru Agreement. Declarations were issued in 2010, 2015, 2018 and 2019, all essentially asserting that Pacific nations can and should fix their maritime boundaries that remain in perpetuity, irrespective of the impacts of sea level rise. In its first issues paper, released by the International Law Commission Group, looking at sea level rise in relation to international law in February 2020, the authors concluded that at least for the Pacific and Southeast Asian regions, there is state practice supported by the practice of international organizations in relation to fixed baselines. And that practice is widespread and representative among states of these regions as well as consistent. However, they concluded that the existence of a pineal urus is not yet that evident. So we effectively have an emerging customary norm within the region and of course, the law of the sea has a strong tradition of developing maritime entitlements through custom, which are subsequently codified. But my question is whether in light of the urgency of the situation and the implications of sea level rise for both national and regime security, whether we can wait for a customary norm to crystallise. So in the final couple of minutes of my remarks, I would like to posit a pragmatic but imperfect solution that particularly affected states, especially in the Indo-Pacific, could adopt, which would increase legal certainty around this issue. That solution is the adoption of an agreement modifying the Law of the Sea Convention, or UNCLOS, to expressly permit and recognise fixed baselines and or outer limits that do not change in response to sea level rise. Modification agreements are permitted under Article 41 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of the Treaties. As you can tell, I'm not even a recovery lawyer. I like my law. Um, provided that those agreements comply with certain conditions. Uh, these include that they are not prohibited by the treaty in question. They're not incompatible with the object and purpose of that treaty. And they do not affect the enjoyment by the other parties of their rights under the treaty. UNCLOS itself specifically permits modification agreements in Article 311 of the Convention on broadly the same conditions. A limitation of this solution, hence imperfect pragmatic, is that a modification agreement is applicable solely to the relations between the parties to the agreement. So this is obviously not ideal in this context, and it would require other states to become a party to the modification agreement or to otherwise recognise the rights of states' parties under that agreement. So why am I proposing a modification agreement on sea level rise? Well, first, the basis for such an agreement has already been developed by the state practice of Pacific Island states and to a lesser extent states elsewhere. There's also a strong degree of support for this practice from other states, particularly in the Pacific region, including, for example, Australia and New Zealand. Pragmatically, the process of modification could be quick and simple, certainly compared to an amendment of UNCLOS or the negotiation of a new standalone treaty. Third, such an agreement would not be compatible with the law, incompatible with the Law of the Sea Convention. It would not be incompatible with the Law of the Sea Convention. It's worth pointing out, as the authors of the International Law Commission first issue papers have done, that while states have interpreted baselines as ambulatory under UNCLOS, this in fact is not explicitly stated in UNCLOS, and there's no express provision that says baselines cannot be fixed. Furthermore, the rights and duties of other states are preserved under this mechanism. States may object to or support a modification agreement, taking into consideration their obligations to support adaptation to climate change. And finally, a modification agreement would provide certainty and promote national and regime security and could operate as a pragmatic first step as customary international law more generally develops. And I look forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Scott, for, for that. And I'll note that you are uh, Zooming in from, from New Zealand, which is a member of the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, uh, unlike uh, the United States, and we already need to modify this. So uh, I think at first the United States needs to ratify the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, and then we can move on to the, to the modification uh, piece as well. 
Um, I, I did want to highlight uh, for, for Ms. Goodman, I'll, I'll open this up to you and, and the other panelists. Um, I'll start my video. All right. You can hopefully see my bright shining, shining face. It is not three o'clock in the morning. You have to start my video at. there, Mark. Okay. okay um, it's been stopped. Thank you. Great. And so what, what I was hoping to do is there are some people who criticize this nexus between security, national security and climate change on one group is uh, frankly, people who deny the climate science. But on the other group is sort of human rights and environmentalists that are very weary of this sort of securitization, militarization of climate change as an environmental issue. Um, and I'll open up to, to Ms. Goodman, and I want to get other thoughts on this as well. Is, is there anything to this criticism? And how, how would you respond to this criticism that this is just the militarization of a core environmental issue? Okay, Mark. Well, thank you uh, for that question. I think we have to um, break it down. I think the criticism has uh, of securitization of climate has evolved out of concern that the solutions to the uh, climate crisis might be in the military sector, which by and large, they are not. So let's be very clear that's a solution to climate change, whether it's the energy transition, reducing mitigation, reducing emissions, mitigation, adaptation, for the most part, are not in the military sector. Um, we do need a whole, you know, a 3D approach diplomatically, uh, but the development and the diplomatic Ds should lead and the military should support. It should, I've argued, as I said in my remarks, for a, for a, um, climatizing security, which is that the security sector itself, and all of us have talked about this in different ways, Alice in particular, um, needs to lead by example, get its house in order. Uh, Dan talked about it as well, you know, improve performance by reducing emissions. DOD has been working on that with, in fits and starts for several decades already. Uh, it also makes, needs to make its installations and infrastructure resilient. Um, and it needs to incorporate climate risk factors into its strategy plans, policy operations at all levels in all theaters. Um, so I think that's what um, that's what I how I would frame it. I think it's sometimes it's an overgeneralization that doesn't get at what the real issue is. Great. Thank you, uh, Ms. Goodman. Other uh, panelists would like to uh, add to that? Uh uh, I'll just add a little bit. Uh, I don't see any basis for that concern. Um, there's no incompatibility. There's no inconsistency between saying it's a um, incompatibility between saying it's a human rights issue, which it is, and it's also a security issue. Um, climate change is going to have huge impacts on um, on human rights, on security relations, on migration, on a whole series of different issues, and so it's not an either or. Uh, I guess, yes, the concern would be if the solution to climate change was military, but I don't think anybody is suggesting that's the implication of drawing a nexus between climate change and security. Uh, the only role of the military, I think, in, in um, addressing climate change in, uh, is uh, reducing its own impact on the climate system, as uh, Sherry just mentioned. And then also, um, in responding to d disasters, um, military has capacity to be able to provide humanitarian relief in disasters. Um, and so I think in that limited respect, I could see a role for the military in responding to climate change uh, itself. But uh, I don't think the, the purpose of drawing the connection between uh, climate and security is not to say that there's a sec military solution to it. Uh, it's to say that it's gonna be having impacts of all different kinds uh, all different uh, sorts, and we need to be thinking about the security impacts, the impacts on security of climate change, as well as its impacts on human rights and other issues. I'll just right, uh, thank you for jump in here. Um, I do think underlying that is the fear that uh, we're going to gr see greater securitization of international relations as a result of climate change. And in 2015, CNA, uh, the uh, think tank, held some war games in New Delhi, India, 
where they or it were uh, a scenario um, using uh, future projections of climate And Miss Hill, I'm not sure if your your screen is frozen. Are the other people seeing her screen frozen, or is it just me? It is um, frozen, so yeah, it's frozen. Well, we'll wait for Miss Hill to come back because I have another question for Professor Scott <laughs> uh, in in her remarks uh, about the changing baselines. And thank you, Professor Scott, for uh, that. Uh, very informative PowerPoint discussion about where UNCLOS needs to go. I, I do want to ask you a subtext, I think, of the sea level rising and the need for baseline changes is that certain nations, not that far from New Zealand, in the Pacific, small island developing states and other nations may be facing the real impacts of sea level rise, uh, extreme flooding, recurrent flooding, and by some estimates, there could be uh, lack of habitable land, maybe even uh, mass migration from, from parts of uh, the Pacific in, in the not too distant future. Uh, Judge Hill mentioned the, the Northern Triangle. Uh, can you just add a little bit of context to what you're seeing with the Pacific migration and small island developing states and how uh, you see that playing out as, as a security issue? Well, thank you very much. Yes, I think um, it certainly is um, an issue, um, not simply for this region, but um, I think some of the first uh, migration as a consequence of climate change has in fact already taken place um, within states. So essentially relocation of people within uh, Fiji um, as a consequence of, of, of sea level rise. Um, certainly, I think for states in the region, there's quite a significant interest in that issue in terms of um, the numbers of people which may well be moving around and the obligations on the states um, potentially to take in those refugees. I know this is something which um, both Australia and particularly New Zealand um, have considered. Um, from an international perspective, there isn't really any consensus as yet as to kind of exactly what states are with respect to kind of mass migration in contrast to um, their obligations, obviously, with respect to individual regimes where that is essentially clearer. Um, but I think that's a, that's a very significant um, security issue. We've certainly seen um, the consequence of sort of mass migration um, and movement of peoples, particularly in Europe, for example, back in 2016. Um, so that is certainly um, part of um, the consideration. So obviously the issue of kind of fixing sort of maritime boundaries may well sort of support resource type issues, but it, it doesn't address um, issues where the land becomes uninhabitable and people are required to move. So I would certainly say that that is a, a very significant security issue, uh, one which is being considered, but is certainly not yet been resolved and of course involves um, considerations of refugee law, human rights law, um, in addition to other bodies of law. Right. Thank you for that, Professor Scott. And of course, is a is a not just a legal question, but also maybe a moral ethical question. What's the responsibility for developed nations in assisting the developing nations, uh, oftentimes poor or lacking the adaptation skills, uh, if they need to leave or have to leave their their land? And I see Judge Hill is with us, so I want to make sure that I that I uh, give you an opportunity to complete your remarks, uh, Miss Hill. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Really, I. The basic point was all the participants in this um, exercise, or not all, but many were surprised by how quickly it turned. And that, I think, is an underlying fear that if we can't really address these threats, uh, we will resort to a militarization and further uh, arming and uh, uh, going down that path. And that's what I think is why there's a, some hesitancy about involving the national security apparatus in climate change in a significant way. But that ignores the fact that there will be, as was described right now by Professor Scott, many cascading impacts flowing from the changes that we're seeing from climate change that we need to be aware of and think about and plan for uh, in the security establishment. 
Right. Thank you for that, Ms. Hill. And I, to be clear, I, I do not share those criticisms, but that there is there is a small but vocal uh, group of people out there that that do have uh, that uh, fear. And I think a lot of it comes down to climate education and climate communication uh, in, in terms of what we're really talking about. If I could just open this up to, I'll not start Ms. Goodman again, but I'll open it up to everyone here. What, what struck me about your comments and remarks is just how broad sweeping this issue of climate security is. We started in the Pacific, we talked about the Arctic, we went back down to um, governance issues and uh, here, uh, domestic response, that natural disaster response. If I could just ask uh, you, Ms. Goodman, and then I'll open up to others, what do you think is one area of climate security that is not getting the attention it needs or an area that we need to be focused more on? Because I think sometimes for people who are new to this area, they might get lost in all just the complexity of this topic. Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question, Mark. I, I do think that, you know, for the JAG community that's listening in here, uh, I mean, understanding how your legal work will be affected by climate changes in, in particular, like I really like Professor Scott's example because she focused very specifically on sea level rise risk in the Pacific region and then propose solutions. We can debate whether those are the right solutions, but she framed a very actionable problem that is occurring um, because of climate change. You know, another area that's underappreciated, I think at this point is, is heat, extreme heat and the impact on health. Um, you know, I, I observed in my remarks that that's going to make large parts of South Asia doesn't have much air conditioning, potentially uninhabitable. But what is it going to mean for our troops? I mean, we already see more Black Flag days where troops can't train because it's too hot. Uh, what about deployments? You know, are we are are are, are uh, mothers and fathers going to be willing to put their sons and daughters at risk um, into these extreme uh, temperature and weather zones? That's just one example, and I think um, there are more. So I think that for the JAG community, kind of pushing the envelope for how each climate peril. Uh, whether it's heat, drought, deforestation, desertification, sea level rise, and in the specific theater and its interactions. That's why I tried to lay out, I thought my speech was a little dense, but it had a lot of relevant content, I thought, that was to this, um, you know, to how to address this in the theater, in the region, in ways that have to become actionable uh, by the security community. And I hope that, um, you know, our JAG community will be on the front lines of helping policymakers and military officers interpret that. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Uh, Professor Badansky or Ms. Hill, you want to add to that? Uh, I can uh, speak. I, I think Sherry is right on. It's uh, if you, uh, as the council uh, to um, a military service, whatever organizations, persons you're um, helping, if you can ask the right questions, you can make a tremendous difference. Um, let's say, and, and I, I don't know all of your responsibilities, but imagine that you're responsible for um, uh, assisting in procurement. Is anyone asking the question, does this stuff work in hotter conditions? Does it, are we getting what we need to get? Now, that's not a legal question. That's a practical question. Does this a smart thing for us to do to go forward with this? But what we need are people asking those questions across the board so that we're making sure we're considering these uh, issues before we march down and create, for example, a plane that doesn't have enough, to, uh, it can't take off on our runways is currently constructed, or that will get stuck in the tarmac, uh, or that we're constructing, um, as we did on Kwajalein, uh, the atoll in the Pacific, a space fence at the cost of a billion dollars. We contracted for it in 2014. At that time, we accepted an environmental review that said sea level rise is not a risk for a, an atoll in the Pacific that's pretty darn flat. Basic 
basic information would have told you that that that's just not correct. And of course, when they did a subsequent uh, review four years later, it was determined that saltwater intrusion would affect the freshwater supplies and affect the island itself. So we need those kind of questions asked. And if it doesn't come from others in the military service, it certainly can come from an informed council saying, have you thought about the whole range of things that could affect this project? Uh, I live in uh, Phoenix. And there was uh, a couple of summers ago, there was uh, a period when uh, planes couldn't take off because it was too hot. They weren't built uh, so that they could actually fly in the heat conditions uh, that were uh, in Phoenix at the time. So, yeah, picking up on the comment just made, you know, one needs to be thinking about all those kind of issues uh, when you're designing new weapons, uh, new military systems. Uh, Let me just bring up a totally different point. You asked if there are things that are being overlooked or maybe not getting enough attention. Um, And something I've been working on recently that I don't think does get enough attention is uh, climate engineering as a potential way of addressing climate change, because having been involved in the climate negotiations now for almost 30 years uh, and seeing the limited progress that's been made in actually reducing emissions, uh, I think one needs to be thinking seriously about alternatives um, that may prove to be necessary to try to address some of the you know, tremendously catastrophic climate impacts that we might be seeing. Uh, and climate engineering is one way of doing that. That's using various technological means to try to reduce warming. Now, uh, it's getting some attention, but one of the issues climate engineering raises is the security issue. Uh, to what degree could, could climate engineering be used in a hostile way? Um, could it provoke conflicts? Um, uh, I think it's maybe one of the uh, approaches to climate change that would have the, the most immediate security implications where the Security Council or the uh, international uh, security uh, system would have to be able to try to figure out what to do if a country decided to go ahead and begin engineering the climate unilaterally or in a small group. So I think that's an issue that... Uh, um, hasn't been thought about enough, uh, probably hasn't been thought about so much. I'm not sure how much it's been thought by the security establishment, uh, but I think it's something worth considering. Uh, I I will just echo that point. Uh, That was included in the executive order drafted on national security and climate change that we should be watching for geoengineering efforts. It could be, may not even be a state actor. It could be just a billionaire or someone else uh, who wants to engage in this. And then the Trump administration, as I recall, did give um, several million dollars to this effort to be able to increase detection of geoengineering across the globe. And that is very important that we understand whether you believe in geo or not believe, but whether you support geoengineering or not, it's critical for the United States to understand what efforts could be underway and how those could affect our security. Great. Thank you for that, uh, Professor Badansky. And uh, I believe there is a a treaty that sort of overlooked the Environmental Modification Treaty, but its applicability to climate really has not been theorized or addressed heavily by scholars. Maybe it's the the, the subject of our next Law Review article. And there is a difference between geoengineering, which is changing the atmosphere, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, sort of an Elon Musk type approach to changing the climate, and also different uh, engineering steps such as carbon sequestration and things along those lines, which have shown some promise, but they're sort of high risk, um, you know, and high and high cost to get them get them started. I, I did want to turn to Professor Scott briefly because I think we have a, a fair amount of, number of questions, and all of them are directed at you. <laughs> and it's three o'clock in New Zealand, so I'm going to pick one that I thought was very interesting, and you can um, go from there. Um, this question is from Abdullah Al Arif, and he asks that with sea level rise, it's going to impact small island states. And they may well disappear at some point in the future. So, so related to the question I asked you, and his point, his ask, asking you about the, the, the number of or what would happen to the maritime entitlements and their rights over marine resources following the maritime zones lost under the ocean. So I'm not sure if you have thought about that. There's a, several questions in the Q&A, which you should also feel free to respond to about sea level rise and maritime zones. 
Well, thank you very much, Mark. And I'm um, delighted to see that it's obviously generated a bit of interest. I think in relation to the um, um, <clears throat> question which um, Adila Abrif has asked, there certainly has been quite significant um, academic consideration of this issue. There are a number of excellent books and articles sort of considering um, this particular problem. Um, currently, from a sort of an international law point of view, you know, we don't have a we don't have a solution. So the idea of maritime zones is that they are predicated on the basis of land territory. So the assumption is if you have no land territory, then there are no maritime zones um, from which um, essentially to make a claim. Um, now, of course, that potentially could lead to very significant inequities. And depending on, you know, what happens in terms of peoples, there may well be really valid reasons for sort of maintaining some form of a maritime zone or at least um, maintaining sort of privileged access to the resources within that area but this is something which I think um, we're going to have to grapple with we certainly don't have the tools under current international law um, to really deal with that or at least current international law would simply um, uh, potentially mean that there there is no state there are no maritime zones but that I think is is very problematic from an, an equitable point of view so there are lots of sort of suggestions around sort of a deterritorialized state so having some sort of a state entity or a quasi state entity um, sort of essentially separating out the idea of territory from state and indeed a, a people but these are all quite theoretical at this stage but I think over the next sort of 10 20 years they're really going to come to the fore of um, international um, international lawyers. Um, Mark, if I may perhaps just briefly address perhaps a couple of the issues raised by some of the some of the questions, I won't be able to get all of them. And I'm really happy for people to to contact uh, me directly. Um, I was quite interested in um, I think it's Stephen Keating's question, which I think has been pushed to the top about whether uh, potentially this mechanism could be used to sort of expand maritime zones seaward. And I can certainly see that that might be a, a consideration. The ILA and indeed, I think the states which are supporting this approach, this idea of fixing um, uh, maritime zones, not the modification as such, have made it really clear that the, the base points must be determined in accordance with international law um, sort of as it stands. So the idea is this shouldn't really really be used or can't be used as a mechanism to um, um, to actually increase your maritime zone. But I think he raises a really interesting question about um, states which have reclaimed land. And for me, I think a really big question in this whole area is if we do adopt some sort of a solution which allows these states to fix maritime zones, are we confining it to those states which are affected by sea level rise as a consequence of climate change? Because, of course, there are a range of reasons why coastlines um, will vary and why um, actually may, maybe a number of states would quite like to do this, which might be unconnected to, to climate change. So I think um, Stephen raises an interesting question in the sense of um, how broad should this go? And um, are we simply looking at sea level rise as a consequence of climate change um, or is it potentially more, more generally? Um, uh, Cornell Overfield raises, I think, a really valid question um, about, well, if you have a, a maritime boundary delimitation treaty or an agreement or a, a decision of a court, then isn't that essentially fixed? And the answer is, is yes, it is fixed. So that is a potential solution and that has been suggested. But about half maritime boundaries globally have not been finally delimited. So it's only a partial solution. Um, and of course, for many, particularly Pacific Island states, they don't necessarily need to delimit the boundary essentially with another state um, we're talking about sort of outer limits as well so I think that's a that's a partial solution but for me that's not a not a full solution because it doesn't really cover um, the entire uh, the entire sort of range of um, sort of boundaries which we may well have to address and I don't think it necessarily provides that certainty if you have a look at the statements coming out of the Pacific there's a real desire for actually creating some certainty around those entitlements and around the resources so I think leaving it simply to individual delimitation or potential um, dispute resolution doesn't really create that certainty. And just very quickly to finish off, um, Andrew Norris, I think, raises a really interesting um, suggestion um, about working through regional fisheries management organisations. He quite rightly points out that a lot of this is actually about fisheries. That's a real concern. Um, and of course, fixing your maritime boundaries won't necessarily um, address full issues relating to fisheries, because, of course, fish may well move, are likely to move as a consequence of changing conditions. So they don't necessarily respect those boundaries. Um, but certainly that is potentially one option. And I'm, I'm, I think that 
that's something definitely worth exploring. Again, I think perhaps the, just the sort of the concern I would have about that is that you're still then dependent essentially upon these states negotiating with or working with a group of states through a regional fisheries management organisation. And I think there's a question as to whether that's you know, appropriate, um, given you're talking about essentially territorial rights associated with a state. Um, but I'm really happy for any of those individuals to contact me directly and perhaps to continue that conversation. So thank you very much for all those wonderful questions. And thank you, Professor Scott, for, for running through the queue so effectively and succinctly. I believe, uh, Commander Petter, we actually are out of time, uh, and uh, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time and the War College's uh, schedule here. As it is 12.20. Uh, um, so with that, thank you so much, Ms. Goodman, Professor Bodansky, uh, Ms. Hill, Professor Scott, joining us. Please get some sleep in New Zealand, and uh, hopefully you can we'll solve this, the, the, the baseline issue shortly. Um, so thank you so much for joining the panel today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. You did a great job. And thanks. Thanks, thank Commander Petta. Great panelists. Thank you. thank you to all my panelists. Yeah, thank you as well. Hey, Professor Nevitt, thank you. Uh, masterfully done. Uh, great thanks to Deputy Undersecretary Goodman for her, her leadership on this issue for such a long time. And Thank you to the expert panelists for their commitment to this issue, especially Karen. Uh, as we've said, it is so so late where you are, and we appreciate you giving time uh, for this discussion. It is. Let's, minute- let's do this next year. It, let's do this next year, and, and let's have it for ninety minutes because there's a lot. There's a lot. Lot to get through. <laughs> there sure was. There sure was. Well, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Professor Nevitt. It is minute twenty-two on my clock here in the East Coast, and we will reconvene at minute. 30 for the Arctic panel. So we will see everyone at minute 30. Hello, welcome back from our break. We will move on to session 10 where we will discuss certain developments in the Arctic. Uh, This panel will be moderated by Professor Katarzyna Zisk of the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. She will be accompanied by Professor Timo Kuivarova of the University of Lapland and Professor Suzanne Lalonde, the University of Montreal. Dr. Zisk, welcome. I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I am um, delighted to have the opportunity to chair this panel. Our discussion will focus on on the rule of law and great power competition in the Arctic, uh, on the intersection between these two um, important aspects of the Arctic dynamics that we have observed in the over the past at least 15 years uh, in particular. So we will look at how these dynamics, both happening in the Arctic region, but also uh, beyond the Arctic region, the spillover effects from, from other regions, how they affect stability and and security in in the Arctic region. So since the turn of the millennium, uh, the Arctic has been receiving a a growing international interest. And as the previous panel uh, has also pointed out, climate change, of course, has been this important, uh, important factor that has spurred a number of important changes in the region, especially because because the region is changing faster than any other place on Earth, uh, twice uh, the global average rate, leading uh, to abrupt and sustained collapse of, um, of uh, ice coverage. So basically what we are witnessing is the opening of the fifth ocean right on the, uh, at the North Americas and Europe's northern perimeter, uh, which has obviously profound uh, implications, including geopolitical implications, creating on the one hand unprecedented development and cooperation opportunities, uh, political, economic and military, uh, uh, including uh, uh, the fact that we have uh, new potentially strategically important sea lines of communication uh, opening uh, in the polar region, easier access to abundant rich uh, energy resources, valuable minerals, metals, abundant fish resources. But at the same time, the development has also led to to heating up the geopolitical tensions uh, in the region, bringing to the surface some of the remaining unresolved legal issues, 
including principles governing the access to this new maritime uh, polar routes opening uh, up there. Uh, even though the Arctic has remained a largely a cooperative space, a free of armed conflict, the region has nonetheless reemerged um, after basically a hiatus of, of more than 20 years as an arena of, uh, for international competition, including military competition. And one major factor that has contributed to that have been Russia's policies. Uh, Moscow has sharply increased its military activity uh, since 2007 and engaged in a large scale military uh, modernization buildup uh, over the past 14 years. And uh, what is important is that uh, the Russian activists in the Arctic cannot be seen as isolated from what Russia is doing in other places. Uh, and, and Russia has been increasingly assertive, uh, uh, as we have observed, uh, in form of cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, interference in electoral processes in Western countries, uh, and of course, the use of, of armed forces uh, to achieve foreign objectives has been very high on the agenda. Uh, as in the case of the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. And these policies have triggered uh, the largest um, reinforcements of NATO's collective defense since the end of the Cold War, including in the Arctic and the North Atlantic, with such steps as, as the reestablishment of the Second Fleet in 2018, uh, to counterbalance the Russian, uh, the growing Russian presence in the region, uh, with the creation of NATO uh, Atlantic Command last year, dedicated to protect uh, the critically important shipping lanes, not least critically important for U.S. Uh, military reinforcements to Europe. So um, we've seen, of course, also uh, NATO and the United States stepping up their naval surface naval presence uh, in the region, air patrolling. Uh, strengthening existing facilities, infrastructure, etc. So uh, in general, uh, there has also been a move towards strengthening cooperation and partnerships uh, in the Arctic region, uh, which, by the way, the United States uh, consider uh, the greatest strategic asymmetric advantage uh, of arrivals in the Arctic, and therefore the cornerstone of the U.S. regional uh, strategy. Uh, we've seen spillover effects from global dynamics into the Arctic, uh, which has been visible also in the form of, of the US-Chinese competition spilling over into the Arctic region. And um, so one of the central and also the hardest objectives uh, for um, policymakers in the region has been to find the balance between, on the one hand, responding to the changing Arctic natural and strategic environment, uh, by providing a uh, credible military presence, um, uh, measured uh, deterrence, uh, and on the other, uh, uh, by continuing to strengthening and building upon the regional venues, uh, the broad governance uh, and cooperation uh, network in order to maintain and enhance the regional stability. And so today we have with us um, leading uh, Arctic experts that have influenced the Arctic debate uh, over many years, influence our thinking about the present state of the Arctic uh, and also uh, about the, how the future may develop. And in order of speaking, we have Professor Timo Koivurova, as been mentioned from the University of Lapland and Professor Zan Lalonde from the University of Montreal. And they are going to shed light on some of the key aspects of the regional development and share with us insights on, as I mentioned, on the intersection between governance and collaboration on the one hand, and also uh, competition uh, in the Arctic uh, with implications these dynamics have for regional stability. Uh, each speaker has around uh, 10 minutes uh, for the remarks and uh, after which we'll have an opportunity to engage uh, in a discussion. I welcome you to use the chat function to send us your questions and comments. So let me then uh, invite Professor Koivurova to take the virtual floor. Timo, the floor is yours. Okay. A greeting from uh, Rovaniemi, Finland from the Arctic. Um, and, and kind thanks for the uh, for the um, organizers uh, for the for the invitation. Important conference. Thanks to the Stock, Stockstone Center, James, Michael, many others. Uh, so let me say a few words about the development of of the Arctic governance, mostly from from kind of international perspective. 
Um, first, I will start by elaborating on the basic framework of Arctic governance. So um, you'll see, um, I had in, in an original, the idea was that there was there would be two maps uh, uh, de de depicting, um, okay, now they are there, depicting the, the Arctic and the Antarctica. So first of all, the Arctic is a full opposite to the, to the Antarctica, not only in terms that the other is a, uh, a continent surrounded by oceans, but and the other is a is, a, is an ocean um, uh, surrounded by continents. But th there are significant differences in the way these areas are governed. Uh, sovereignty of the eight states and their sovereign marine rights cover much of the Arctic region. In total contrast to the Antarctica, where there are no active sovereigns, and it is governed by an international governance regime called the Antarctic Treaty System. Um, it is important to keep this in mind um, because even authoritative forums like the European Union's Parliament have suggested that the Arctic should be governed in a way similar to the Antarctica. Overall, we can also say that the Arctic is a good example of multi-level governance area where international law and policy, national laws of the eight Arctic states, including the influence of the European Union in the European side of the Arctic, uh, subnational governance and also in some cases customer governance systems of indigenous peoples are are important. If we examine the marine areas uh, which are melting as I speak and dramatically so the the volume of Arctic sea ice present in the month of September has declined by seventy five percent since nineteen seventy nine so these are governed by the constitution of the oceans, law of the sea, UN, law of the sea convention, as we have been dis dis uh, discussing here, manifestly mostly also customary international law or the various international maritime organization convention and many other global and semi-global agreements. Also, what I want to highlight, it is important to realize that many important decisions over the Arctic are done outside of the Arctic. Many of the processes that determine the faith of the Arctic are governed globally, in particular the climate change. It is not enough that there are prevention measures laid down in the Arctic Council for black carbon and methane if the Paris Climate Agreement doesn't start to function. And now, of course, we have some promising signs um, uh, in that respect from, from the US and, and, and also from, from China. In a similar way, the hard security environment of the Arctic is nowadays characterized more and more by tensions between major powers, in particular USA versus China and USA versus Russia. For instance, it seems to me that the perception that China is a threat in the Arctic is stemming more from global tensions between US and China rather than any real Arctic regional dynamics. Second, I will take a look at how Arctic international governance has evolved. So, Looking at a couple of past decades, we have witnessed a lot of international co cooperation in the Arctic, but gradually also more geopolitical tensions in the region in the, in the few past years. The only standing collaborative international intergovernmental forum is the Arctic Council, founded in 1996, focused on common issues related to the Arctic, in particular environmental protection, sustainable development, and explicitly excluding military security issues. It has also catalyzed three legally binding agreements between the eight Arctic states on search and rescue, oil spill preparedness and response, and scientific cooperation, all touching heavily also on marine areas. And tomorrow, as, as Honorable Sherry Goodman already told us, we have the foreign ministers meeting of the Arctic Council in Reykjavik, ending the Icelandic chairmanship and, and, and commencing then the Russian chairmanship uh, of the council. Arctic Ocean coastal states, so coastal states, so those uh, five states, uh, Norway, uh, Denmark, Greenland, uh, Canada, USA, Russia, also started to convene in 2008, excluding Finland, Iceland, Sweden, who are, who are members of the Arctic Council. Uh, but this forum did not evolve into a standing intergovernmental forum, even if, it, even, even if it was those states that did the groundwork for what became the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement signed in 2018 and soon to enter into force. So we have clearly witnessed a lot of cooperation between the Arctic states. 
Yet it is also the case that we have in the few past years faced more and more geopolitical tensions in the Arctic, even if, for instance, the Arctic Council was able to, almost without interruption, go about its business after the Crimean annexation and the sanctions regimes, it did have an impact on the hard security cooperation in the region. So the Arctic chiefs of defense meetings were cancelled after the illegal Crimean annexation by Russia, and the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable, a kind of larger security forum, convenes nowadays without Russia. The turbulent Trump presidency had a chilling effect on the Arctic Council cooperation, especially for climate change cooperation in the council. But it also worsened the relations between USA and China, USA and Russia in the Arctic as well. And during that time, the US uh, started to also pay attention to its diplomatic and military presence in the Arctic, which has kind of gradually become stronger. Currently, the relations between Russia and the Western member states of the Arctic Council are difficult because of the overall manifold tensions between Russia and the Western states and, 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 and many kinds of sanctioned regimes uh, uh, at work for various purposes. And there are also problems in the relations between USA and China in the Arctic, but as I already argued, um, more related to their overall tensions. Finally, where should we go? Where, where should we then go from here? So there are two proposals to improve the Arctic international cooperation, which differ quite much from each other. And of course, the, uh, why they differ is, is that they are, they are launched from, from different directions. So first of all, for, for especially environmental NGOs, the main problem uh, seems to be that there is no real governance mechanism to make decisions over the melting Arctic Ocean. They would like to see the Arctic states and perhaps some others to establish a regional seas agreement on the base of such models operating in the Baltic Sea or the Northeast East Atlantic. The problem here is that the Arctic states have not shown any political appetite for establishing such standing regional intergovernmental legal body as they have problems even with making the current Arctic Council an intergovernmental organization. Then from another direction, some academic think tanks have been unhappy about the fact that, that military security issues have been excluded from the mandate of the Arctic Council and that after the Crimean annexation, there are no forums for meeting and talking about hard security issues in the Arctic. The problem in this proposal for me personally is this. If we agree that the overall tension tensions in the Arctic do not derive from the Arctic competition type of scenarios, kind of scramble for resources between the Arctic states because of Arctic reason, re reasons in the, in the Arctic, but rather from the overall relations between Western states, Russia, USA, China, spilling over to the Arctic. It doesn't seem justified to call for Arctic security forums as the problems lie elsewhere than in the Arctic. Yet, and this, to, this is to conclude the presentation, even if I do not see any grand solutions for Arctic international governance, we should also remind ourselves that we have quite a lot of international cooperation and cooperative achievements in the Arctic that are functioning, even in these times of tensions. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Timo. That was uh, perfect timing. Um, Excellence 360 toward the uh, Arctic governance. I have uh, noted a couple of questions, but we will first listen to uh, Professor Lalonde and, and her presentation. And so, uh, and then we will uh, have the opportunity to comment and, and ask questions. Professor Lalonde, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking Lieutenant Carmley and Commander Peta for their generous invitation and the Neighbor Wall College to participate in this session. I'm deeply honored to be involved in the Cushing Conference. Timo has just provided a terrific overview of international and regional cooperation in the Arctic. And he spoke of collaborative processes and even achievements despite increasing geopolitical tensions between certain actors. I believe that the North American Arctic is another example of successful collaboration. In this case of bilateral cooperation, promoting defense and broad security interests, despite some sensitive disagreements. There can be no denying that a long-standing disagreement exists between Canada and the United States in respect to the legal status of the Northwest Passage within the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. 
Also, the maritime boundary between the two neighbors and the Beaufort Sea has not yet been resolved. However, almost 60 years to the day, on the 17th of May, 1961, President Kennedy addressed the Canadian Parliament and he provided um, some very sage insight into the US-Canada relationship. We are allies, he stated. This is a partnership, not an empire. We are bound to have differences and disappointments. We are equally bound to bring them out into the open, to settle them where they can be settled, and to respect each other's views when they cannot be settled." End of quote. I believe President Kennedy's insistence on respect for each other's views is an essential, if not the essential ingredient for any meaningful bilateral uh, cooperation. And it has been the cornerstone of Canada-US collaborative efforts in the Arctic over the course of many decades. The establishment of NORAD in 1957 as a binational centralized air and eventually maritime defense command, I think is compelling evidence of mutual trust and respect. In the third preambular paragraph of the NORAD agreement, which was recently in 2006 uh, renewed, both Canada and the United States attest to their conviction that such cooperation is a proven and flexible means to pursue shared goals and interests, that it remains vital to their mutual security, and that it is compatible with their national interests. Collaboration is thus recognized not only as a valuable and efficient means to achieve shared objectives, but recognized also as a powerful mechanism for the advancement of national interests. Another telling example of President Kennedy's respectful understanding is the 1988 Canada-US Agreement on Arctic Cooperation. It is widely understood, at least in Canada, that if an agreement was reached, was eventually reached, it was thanks to the close relationship between President Reagan and Prime Minister Mulroney. But more importantly, again, according to Canadian lore, <laughs> that it was thanks to President Reagan's deep understanding of the political sensitivity of the Northwest Passage issue on the Canadian side and his remarkable determination to find a way forward. Thanks to the ingenuity of lawyers at the State Department and Canadian Foreign Affairs, the agreement provides that US icebreakers proposing to engage in research while transiting through the Northwest Passage will ask the Canadian government for permission to do so, and that Canada will, of course, give its consent. This arrangement is entirely consistent with the regime governing marine scientific research as laid out in the Law of the Sea Convention. And yet, of course, it's a terribly elegant way out of the impasse. And in addition, Article 4 of the agreement uh, explicitly states that nothing in the agreement can prejudice either party's legal position. There is therefore no concession, no dilution of Washington's legal position, or indeed its wider freedom of the seas policy, while I would suggest conferring the benefits of having the waters under the sovereignty of its NORAD partner. Canada and the US have therefore found ways to set their legal differences aside and get on with the business of resolving issues of mutual uh, interest and concern. And, and this collaboration in regards to the marine Arctic uh, occurs at multiple levels. Time permits only a few examples. This summer, the largest icebreaker in the US Coast Guard fleet, the Healy, will be transiting through the Northwest Passage. In making the announcement during his State of the Coast Guard address in March, Admiral Schultz made a point of emphasizing that the mission was being planned along with Foreign Affairs Canada. And a spokesperson for the US Coast Guard later confirmed that the mission was definitely not a fun op. Of course, the Healy's transit is covered by the 1988 Arctic Cooperation Agreement. There will be 20 scientists on board and they will be conducting scientific research. Still, as Professor Buford from the University of Fairbanks in Alaska has emphasized, the announcement and the way it was, the tone of it sent a clear message that the official status of the Northwest Passage is somewhat less important than being able to collaborate and operate with expectations and confidence with close partners. 
it was certainly a very welcome message in Canadian circles, contrasting with the headlines in late 2018 and 2019 that announced plans for U.S. Navy freedom of navigation ops in the Arctic uh, without saying exactly where in the Arctic. Last week at the meeting of the Arctic Security Working Group that's chaired by Joint Task Force North up in Yellowknife, the Canadian Coast Guard provided some details of the Healy's trip and mentioned that a SAR exercise with the Healy was being planned near Resolute Bay in early September. In that forum, the Healy's trip was described as tremendously valuable, a tremendously valuable opportunity, a joint research and educational collaboration at a time when conditions in the Northwest Passage and indeed throughout the Arctic are changing dramatically. I should add that this joint venture no doubt has been greatly facilitated by the relationships that have been built through the annual summits that occur between the Canadian and U.S. Coast Guards. The Arctic Security Working Group was also briefed by Canadian Armed Forces on its Nanook operations this summer. Op Nanook to Gallic is the maritime deployment component of the Nanook series. This summer in early August, um, Canada's Goose Bay, a Kingston class um, coastal defense vessel, with the Harry de Wolf, um, the first of Canada's new Arctic offshore patrol ships, will sail from Halifax North in company with one US Navy Arleigh Burke class destroyer and one or possibly two Coast Guard cutters. They will head for Iqaluit uh, in Nunavut and en route, the Canadian and American ships will be conducting multi-ship maneuvers, warfare and security serials ranging from seamanship evolutions, force protection training to weapons firings. As the commander of Canada's Maritime Forces Atlantic has emphasized, Opna Nook aims to foster multinational cooperation and trust, trust as a catalyst for capable and adaptable uh, maritime forces in a challenging Arctic marine environment. The Canadian and American ships will eventually rendezvous with the Canadian Coast Guard Pierre Radisson uh, in Iqaluit and will join uh, JTFN for the Tatijit uh, portion of Opna Nook. This will consist of a series of maritime security events that will culminate in, uh, in mid-August with a major maritime rescue operation. This year, it's a cruise ship in distress. U.S. Uh, participation is seen as critical, as it is widely ac acknowledged, and I would say not just on the Canadian side, that uh, in such a disastrous um, scenario in the far north, uh, support from neighbours and close allies will, may very likely be needed. The Harry the Wolf and the, the U.S. ships will then sail to Nuke for a fuel stop, and there are plans for the Danish Navy uh, to participate in some of the training serials uh, as the ships get closer to Nuke. After the fuel stop in Nuke, the U.S. ships will uh, head south towards Halifax, and the Canadian Defence Department has offered them the opportunity to have an encounter exercise using the Goose Bay as the vessel of interest. At the opposite end of state-to-state -state co cooperation, northern communities are also collaborating, and these will be my last examples. The Alaskan Arctic Waterway Safety Committee was established in October 2014 as a self-governing multi-stakeholder group that is focused on improving communications, mapping, and marine policies to promote maritime safety, to protect the marine environment, and also, uh, critically, to preserve the lifestyles of those who live in the Arctic. The committee is fantastic. It's made up of a wide array of maritime users and stakeholders. I mean, from subsistence hunters to local and tribal governments to advocacy groups and even industry representatives from oil and gas developers, tug and barge operators, etc. Thanks to Canadian federal funding, community members from um, Cambridge Bay, it's a small hamlet of about 1,400 inhabitants at the southeast corner of Victoria Island and right on the shore of one of the uh, Northwest Passage routes, uh, were able to travel to Alaska and to learn, to learn from the Alaskan Arctic Waterways Safety Committee. And the result of that engagement, well, the creation of the Victoria Island um, a Waterway Safety Committee. Last example, the Alaskan Marine Exchange, for its part, has been instrumental in um, the establishment of a very uh, exciting new project, the Inuit Marine Monitoring Program in Nunavut. 
a program that couples uh, seasoned, experienced Inuit hunters as marine monitors with real-time vessel tracking technology. The Alaskan Marine Exchange has supplied many of the terrestrial AIS deployed across Nunavut and has also assisted in the training of the Inuit monitors. And there are many, many other examples of maritime cooperation. In concluding, I would just like to emphasize that it is because the Canada-US relationship of trust and respect is so well and so long established that meaningful cooperation has withstood the vagaries of political personalities and specific agendas. Irrespective of short-term rifts, the recognition that collaboration and cooperation serves the interests of both states and jurors. And I would suggest that climate change and the foreign interest it has sparked in the Arctic region, including in the North American Arctic, has only confirmed the necessity for such a strong partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. It was a brilliant presentation, which took us you know, from, on the different levels from the more overarching, broader Arctic regional to the local. Uh, I think there is a lot to um, uh, to touch upon, but since I uh, since I have you here, I think I would uh, I would follow up uh, on the question and international uh, cooperation, if I may, Suzanne. Um, and so, you know, I, I've mentioned in my introductory remarks uh, what what we've observed. Uh, over the past at least 14 years, so basically, but really since the turn of the millennium, the increasing international interest uh, for the Arctic from different uh, parts of, of the world, uh, which have brought to the surface a broad spectrum of challenges and opportunities. So if you could uh, elaborate on, on how this foreign interest has impacted uh, the US-Canadian relationship and, and if you can say something about how do you see the optimal outcome moving ahead, especially as the Biden administration is taking, is starting, uh, showing us what do they, what they have in cards uh, when it comes to, to the Arctic region. Thank you so much for the question. Um, just very quickly, it's just that um, when I first got interested in the Northwest Passage debate, uh, almost like 20 years ago, it was really something that uh, Canadian and U.S. Uh, lawyer, lawyerly types like to debate. I mean, uh, I've lost count of how often uh, James Kraska and I have uh, disagreed. Um, and it was seen as this like quaint little issue between us, you know, um, and what I feel, uh, and I think this is my, my pitch for increased and continued cooperation is I think we're losing control or it's becoming much larger. And I see a certain trend of interest. You, you yourself were mentioning uh, new sea lines of communication, uh, opening up of Arctic shipping routes. And I was trolling through Arctic policies. And of course, the Chinese white paper in 2018 has ambiguous language. It, it, it groups the Northwest Passage with Arctic shipping routes. And then further in the paragraph talks about freedom of navigation. And, and so, while understanding the U.S. position, it's like a plea to uh, maybe have a, a solid, a, a common front here, uh, because for Canada, this is a critical issue, more ships, uh, more activity. So uh, not just, you know, ships for resource exploitation, but just more ships. And there's also mounting pressure from our indigenous uh, uh, citizens in the north uh, and constitutional obligations to consult on governing uh, marine uh, areas in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. And so it's, it's trying to make sure that we're respectful of, uh, of, of rights, uh, making sure, of course, we're open to navigation and shipping, but we want it to be responsible navigation and shipping and respectful of priorities identified by indigenous citizens. Um, so, um, and so, that's why I think, you know, you should have seen the email tracks bouncing around after Admiral Schultz made his, <laughs> his announcement, just this, this like reset of, uh, uh, we don't agree, but, you know, let's work together. And I think this is going to be uh, critical for Canada. Uh, and and we, we need that kind of uh, sort of uh, um, um, way forward, if I could say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Susan. I think, I mean, there are many interesting issues here, but I, I just sitting here wondering how the Russian um, chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which they are taking over uh, tomorrow, 
for the next two years, how this, for instance, will, will do, it will impact probably a number of, of, of key aspects of the regional development, um, including, and it will be very interesting to, to see how they will be treating the issue of, of the uh, rights of the indigenous people in the region as we as they move through the, uh, the broad spectrum of economic, uh, you know, diplomatic, but also military issues, although the, this is not a part of the uh, Arctic Council agenda. And here I would like to move to Timo um, before I open the floor for, uh, for our, our public to comment and ask questions. I have already, I have noted some uh, already. Uh, Timo, um, my question concerns the, um, the Arctic, uh, the chairmanship, the Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, uh, as I said, uh, they are taking over, and and the R Russia uh, has come up with the with the program for the chairmanship. They mentioned a number of key objectives like the environmental protection, social and economic development, and not least the role of the Arctic Council. And they they said they would be strengthening uh, the the role of the Arctic Council as the key platform for the multilateral cooperation. So my question to you is: is how do you see? Uh, in your opinion, how Russia may achieve the objective of strengthening the, the Arctic Council, how they may be moving uh, ahead, may, how they may steer this forum, uh, uh, but also in general, how do you see how they will be um, moving, in which direction they will be moving the Arctic governance more broadly? Thanks, uh, very, very good question. I, th I think that, I think it's, it, it's very important to also like, like, like separate the, the kind of Arctic Council chairmanship of, of Russia from its kind of general policy stance, general policies or, or about the Arctic, because they they obviously serve different purposes. When when a country is a chair of the Arctic uh, Council, obviously it serves also the the basic objectives of of this uh, organization. Um, and and Russia has really, um, I think that the, its chairmanship programs it hasn't laid out very detailed chairmanship program, but those segments that it has opened up, uh, especially the strengthening of the Arctic Council, it, it stems already from a fairly long period of work, you know, throughout years um, with different chairmanships about trying to come up with a long-term strategy for the Arctic Council with which we could kind of, in a kind of systematic manner, strengthen the Arctic Council. Um, and and it does clearly put a lot of effort. Uh, seems to put a lot of at least verbal effort effort in that. Um, it also celebrates the the Arctic Council as, as one of the few forums where it can where it can kind of constructively work with the Western states of the uh, of the Arctic Council. And it has now even proposed that these Arctic Defense Chiefs meetings should be resumed, which was um, at least for me for myself a, a, a bit of a bit of a surprise. Um, I think that it's also important to now kind of think about this as a as a, as a, as a kind of reset in the sense that, that the Trump administration obviously had a had a as I already called it a chilling effect on, on the Arctic Council cooperation because they really attacked on on its very core the, the, the kind of climate change cooperation. And now we have Biden administration. So even if Biden has been very tough on, on Russia on in general level and, and, and that's that's of course the kind of kind of overall level level relations um, obviously his administration is very much kind of advocating the combat of climate change and, and adaptation to, to its impacts in the Arctic so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that US and, and Russia can find itself a new uh, in uh, Arctic Council cooperation but of course we have to keep in mind all the time these kind of deepening other and a little bit disturbing signs that we are getting that Russian and, and Western, especially USA relations are getting all the time uh, uh, more and more difficult issues and more and more san sanctions regimes, etc. But overall, I would say that there are more positive signs that the Arctic Council cooperation during the, the reign of, 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 of Russia will go to the right direction. Thank you very much, Sima. I think um, I, I fully agree with you. And I would also add that we, we've seen um, that despite this quite, I mean, increasing and heating up of the geopolitical tensions uh, uh, over the past decade and more, 
that that the countries yes have been able to cooperate and i think from you know from my studies of russia it's also been clear that russia has been very capable of kind of keeping these things apart they are very cooperative they are extremely interested of presenting themselves and being a reliable arctic stakeholder where at the same you know and saying uh uh, basically, since uh, I've heard that phrase since 2009, that you know there are basically no issues in the Arctic that that should be solved with military issues. While at the same time, of course, we have all this military uh, military buildup, which is, as you mentioned in your presentation, yes, it does. Mostly is connected, for instance, in case of Russia, to nuclear deterrence, which is you know it's not about the Arctic region really. But there are also some aspects of that development that actually are aimed at military missions in the Arctic, in the Arctic region. But again, they have been very able of keeping these things quite separate. Uh, we can, of course, discuss whether it's a good thing or not, but that's, that's another question. We have a very good uh, question from uh, Stephen Keating. So uh, in the chat. Uh, who asks uh, the following, if the Arctic ice melts, uh, that areas are no longer subject to the ice cover uh, for most of the year, how do you see the uh, unclosed article 234 being interpreted or applied, given the fact that the loss of ice may actually create even greater environmental risks? Has the Arctic Council addressed this impact of climate change? Who uh, would like to start? <laughs> uh, Suzanne? Please. Um, this is a this is a very hot issue, and there have been some published uh, articles on this, uh, notably by Russian colleagues in uh, ocean development and international law. So, thank you for the question. I love though that you 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 know you've ten, you've given me the life uh, life jacket at the end, um, because of course Canada and also Russia are very interested in Article Two Three Four. We're instrumental in negotiating it with. It's one of the only uh, provisions in the Law of the Sea Convention that you can actually say three states created it, um, US, Canada, and Russia. And it's supposed to be this like source of uh, environmental jurisdiction uh, because the ice is, uh, the, the waters are covered by ice for most of the year. And I was for most of the year. And so of course the ice melting has created this, this, this debate and this reflection over uh, what if there's not ice for most of the year. Um, I'm great. It's 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 um it's a uh, an argument a plaidoyer like I'm pleading. Um, I would hope that the raison d'être, you know, the, the reason for adopting two three four, uh, comes into play as we move forward. And that was these are sensitive waters, dangerous to navigate, pollution would be devastating. So because if you start to just say what's it going to be once we like when it's 49 percent of the, of the year there's there, there, there's no ice okay two three four doesn't apply but the following year there's a lot of ice because there is variability so one year two three four applies the other it doesn't um i think as uh, 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 uh Stephen was saying it was about environmental protection so there will be icebergs there'll be ice during the winter months, there's always going to be like a, a single year ice. There will be ice. And as long as they're ice and they are, you know, covered a lot by ice, whether it's most of the year, I just hope we don't take that kind of really technical picky. Uh, but that's a Canadian saying that. So <laughs> uh, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Timo, would you like to add something? Nothing really. I mean, obviously, like, like the... I think that it is, it is normally kind of addressed in, in terms that whether the justification for the for using Article Two Three Four kind of melts away. That's that's kind of the normal framing of it. So, but I but I do agree on on many of the arguments that that Susan um, uh, laid out. Just to mention that there was this Arctic Council um, kind of component to the question. So so obviously Arctic Council doesn't have any any kind of mandate to, to, you know, say anything about these issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question, which is to Professor Lalonde, Professor Zusk. <laughs> um, if more flag states get involved in Arctic shipping, do you see uh, more states taking more explicit positions against Russian and Canadian positions? I, I, I interpreted that it concerns the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route. Will that make the U.S. position more or less important. <laughs> Shall I start? Um, 
I think there is, I mean, I, that's, you know, I'm basically from the beginning, this is, this is one of those unresolved uh, legal issues. And I, I definitely think that, that there is a potential that, that the issue, so let's, let me take, let me take, uh, let me take the Northern Syria, then I leave the Northwest Passage to Susan, that, that there is a p- potential that this can, that the, so the interpretation the Russian basically claiming the North, Northern Syriot as under Russian jurisdiction, you know, as you know, the Northern Syriot is, is a, can be a, a number, quite varying uh, shipping lanes depending on ice conditions, sometimes even crossing into the high seas, but there are in particular four straits um, along this passage that are considered by Russian internal waters and why uh, the United States and other nations, they would consider them international straits and thus the subject to, to uh, the right for, for transit passage. And uh, so that's that's one of the, the bone of contention that has been actually, this issue has been popping out. Suzanne has meant, meant mentioned uh, the uh, phonops. So the, uh, the mentioned by, by the former uh, US um, administration, the Secretary of the Navy there, that yes, there might be a, a freedom of, of navigation uh, operations conducted in the Arctic, which also was, was, you know, as we also looked uh, on the Russian side as well, whether that, that can apply there. So I think there is a potential, but I also would think that as we try, I think we, we all sort of um, try to point out that the Arctic is extremely complex when it comes to this, you know, this, there are various levels combining. So, you know, the regional level, sub-regional level, but also global issues spilling over into the Arctic. And I think I think that would depend. This kind of issue could heat, heat up and 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 become a problem, depending on the on the function of the relations, for instance, between Russia and the United States, between the China and Russia, uh, China and the United States. So I think this will be a function of of the broader sort of dynamics uh, um, ongoing on the on the international stage. But again, as the uh, importance of this uh, and viability of this maritime uh, channels increases. I think there is a potential that this, this issue will have to be sort of dealt with. That would be my my take on it. Suzanne? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I've been, I don't know, I've been waging this battle. Uh, I'd love for the world at large to not link the Northern Sea Route with the Northwest Passage. If you, if you go back to Timo's map, I mean, the various routes of the Northwest Passage cut through 40% of Canada's landmass. I challenge anyone out there to find any other international strait that cuts through 40% of a state's uh, landmass. Because remember, uh, Catherine Zina was saying the Transit Passage, that's also an air corridor, an international air corridor. So ships of all nations, civilian, military, aircraft, let's go cutting across the archipelago. And we're talking about 94 major islands 36,469 minor islands. So it's, you know, um, add to that, that Canada's shipping regime has been in place since the early 1970s. Lloyd's Insurance in London loves the Canadian regime so much that it's asking ships to be consistent with those rules if they want insurance. Canada has stepped softly, softly. We don't demand icebreaker escort. We certainly don't charge. Uh, We don't even charge for SAR, for search and rescue, when some crazy European wants the adventure of a lifetime and is going to go through the Northwest Passage on his little sailboat. We have tried, I would think, to be transparent and reasonable in saying, look, these are for environmental and security and to protect the waters. So, we hope that yes, there and because you know, I think it was Trudeau uh, Senior with less hair in 1969 that says, well, of course, we we're not going to block off the Northwest Passage to ships. We just want it to be done right. So I think in those there may be, and I, I was saying I was talking about the Chinese policy. Germany has some weird language in its updated revised guidelines, but um, but yeah, it, pressure might mount. But I think. Um, I think hopefully um, the regime, the Canadian regime, isn't so like hard hitting that ships or operators will feel, uh, how would you say, like limited in their rights. And a last pitch, I don't think it's in the U.S. interest. I understand. I've always been told by my colleagues, my American colleagues, even from Ash Roach, 
decades ago, look, it's not about Canada. We just have to protect our position elsewhere. So I don't think it's in the US position uh, uh, interest to suddenly have an international waterway and an international airspace cutting through Northern North America. So uh, my hope is between Canada and US, my pitch in my presentation, let's keep things going. And uh, hopefully Canada can massage feelings internationally and say, look, and last point, I promise, in any case, apparently the transpolar shipping route will open soon, which is catastrophic, but nevertheless, and the Northwest Passage isn't even going to be interesting for any, for, in any case. And I'm really happy about that, actually. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And I think we are, we are approaching the end of the panel, but Timo, you will actually have the last words. So please, you have, a, you have had a comment. Yes. Yeah, just, just about those two, two passages, I, I would say that I'm, I'm, I'm still of the opinion that, that um, I think that the historic internal waters argument, to some extent, it carries some, some problems. But on the other hand, there is the Inuit occupation argument, which, which I think that is a strong one. If you look at the, the Northern Sea Route legislation, I think that it's, it's in clear violation of the law of the sea um, in the Russian side. So, so I don't think that there is any kind of, um, any kind of real scholarly debate, I mean, let's say outside of Russia uh, about whether it is, but I just don't see anyone going, going to those maritime regions and challenging the Russian position, uh, you know, with them having all, all their their military might exactly in those regions. So so it is it is indeed very difficult to imagine. Thanks. Uh, this would have been certainly um I think there would be again the, the the geopolitical sort of background for this kind of move would have to be quite particular because that, that would be quite escalating uh, a move. But I, I mean again it's we, we can imagine that but but that would have quite profound consequences. But I, again, we, we have, uh, unfortunately, we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have uh, run out of time. So uh, I would love to thank you. Uh, thank, um, uh, thank you, Timo and Suzanne for, for excellent contribution, brilliant talks. And I will give words to Commander Peta. Well, Dr. Zisk, Professor Kuiverova and Professor Lalonde, thank you so much. Uh, we were lucky to have your rich expertise uh, in such a compact amount of time. Uh, we wish you all the best uh, moving forward. And for the audience, it is now minute 20. We will reconvene to talk a little more about illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing at minute 50. We will see you then. Hello and welcome back from our break. We are about to begin session 11, which addresses illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, often referred simply as IUU fishing or IUUF. IUU fishing is a multifaceted, complicated issue, and we're lucky to have with us today Dr. Whitley Somweber of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Captain Mike Sinclair of the United States Coast Guard, Ms. Mavish Madad, from the Department, U.S. Department of State and Ms. Karen Staus from the U.S. Department of Justice to talk further on this topic. Now with that, Captain Sinclair, I turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon. I'm Captain Michael Sinclair, the Coast Guard's Federal Executive Fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I'm delighted to be here today. Many thanks to the U.S. Naval War College Stockton Center for hosting this discussion on illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. We are very pleased to have as our keynote speaker, Dr. Whitley Salmweiber, the director of, of the Stevenson Ocean Center, excuse me, the Stevenson Ocean Security Project Center for Strategic and International Studies and visiting professor from the University of Rhode Island's Department of Marine Affairs. I'm really looking forward to his remarks. After his presentation, Dr. Sunweber will be joined in a panel discussion by Ms. Mavish Madid from the Department of State's Legal Office and Ms. Karen Staus from the Department of Justice. But first, I'd like to just offer a brief overview to help set the stage for where we're going this afternoon. Fishing is a $401, $401 billion global industry. It provides 20% of the protein intake for nearly half of the world's population. 
Global fish consumption has been on the rise for almost 60 years, yet 93% of the world's fish stocks are fully exploited, overexploited, or significantly depleted. And global climate change is strongly exact, excuse me, and global climate change is adversely affecting stocks. Overexploitation has many roots, but is strongly exacerbated by illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. And this issue is particularly acute in the developing world where coastal states may not have the fiscal capacity to field robust patrol measures to deter, check, counter, and respond to IUU fishing within their exclusive economic zones. Fish stock sustainment requires management, and management really needs a regional focus because fish, well, they move. Illegal, unregulated, and unreporting fishing characterizes actors, both state and non-state, attempts to circumvent that management. Management can take many forms for, of coastal state measures. Regional, there are regional or multilateral or bilateral agreements that cover many different types of fish or regulate things like gear and vessel size. There are fish specific measures. And in some cases, there are smaller bilateral, and bilateral enforcement agreements between nations. Our panel is Ms. Manish Madad from the Department of State's Office of the Legal Advisors going to discuss some of these international vehicles a little later in the afternoon. But like many maritime issues, IUU fishing can lead to a true tragedy of the commons or race to the bottom, where the actions of but a few malign actors can have far-reaching intertwined global effects. These include threats to the environment, specifically vulnerable fish stocks, and increasingly threats to international and regional stability. For a few reasons. First, food insecurity can drive instability. And as China has continuously demonstrated with its fishing fleet, the world's largest, and that in many cases also doubles as regional maritime militia, IUU fishing can be used as a means to exploit the resources of other nations, attempt to exercise dominion and control over disputed maritime areas, and in some cases, bully neighbors. Chinese distant water fishing fleets off of South America at the end of last year and the beginning of this year is a great example of that, along with China's history of operating in and near African waters. And one wonders whether the burgeoning Chinese operated port facility in Djibouti has a future as a fishing vessel staging location. And then most recently, we've seen um, activity at White Sun Reef, which is a maritime territory in dispute between China and the Philippines. And this dispute remains ongoing. Regardless, Chinese IU fishing, be it off the coast of South, Af South America or Africa, and the Chinese fishing fleets in the South China Sea arise from many of the same competitive drivers, access, dominion, and sovereignty, and rely on the same tools, subsidies, vessels, and capacity. Both are indicators of how China views its fishing fleet as a useful tool for state action. But Chinese fishing shenanigans aside, and it's not just China, for example, South Korea and India have also historically engaged in IUU activities. And the United States has issued withhold release orders covering catch from four Taiwanese fishing vessels due to forced labor concerns since 2019. And then closer to home, the United States struggles mightily with Mexican launchers operating in the US EEZ. Part of the struggle with the, with the Mexican launches links to a fundamental concept of international maritime law, which generally prohibits criminal enforcement of fishing activities. And that's codified at Article 73 of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And you can imagine the policy purpose behind that, which is to try to avoid uh, criminalizing the activity of um, the, the citizens of, of developing natures. But there is an exception and that exception at Article 73 contemplates uh, bilateral agreements between countries, which that if both nations agree, can facilitate uh, criminalization. And, and I suspect that we'll hear from Dr. Sumweber a little bit about that shortly. And then in addition to the, the, the substantive the substantive illegality of uh, certain fishing at fishing based activities, there's the associated criminal activity beyond fishing itself where there is significant evidence, significant evidence of other illegal acts, specifically forced labor and human trafficking. Our, our panelist, Ms. Karen Stiles from the Department of Justice is, is going to discuss this dynamic specifically. As Mike noted, IU fishing is a complex, complicated issue. To help us better understand its relevance in the 21st century, 
I'm going to turn the floor over in just a second to our keynote speaker, Dr. Witt Sunweber, for some additional foundational background. And then we'll talk with Mavish on the state of play on relevant international agreements that address IEU phishing. And then we'll hear some of the associated criminal, criminal activity that we see time and time again from these cases from Karen. And hopefully we'll reserve 15 or 20 minutes towards the end of the, the hour for your questions. As a reminder, if you have them, please put them in the Q&A and I'll make sure to work them into uh, that aspect of the presentation. And with that, Witt, I'd like it to turn it over to you. Please take it away. Great, thanks so much, Captain. Thanks for the introduction and uh, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. It's really quite an honor uh, uh, to join you all today to talk about this, this topic. Uh, this is uh, something that I've been working on for a number of years. and. Um, I'm really uh, uh, pleased that it's become um, uh, a much greater interest uh, across both the uh, um, international policy and security uh, communities. So I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna try to do something a little bit uh, different than I normally do, which is start off with just some brief remarks and then uh, open up some slides. Cause I think that they will actually help us to sort of think through this issue in some detailed way. Cause as, as uh, Mike mentioned, it, it is fairly complex. So um, hopefully that'll help us out. But just, just briefly, I wanna talk about um, this idea that uh, we're facing an increasingly dynamic world. Uh, it's one that's moving away from steady state in terms of ecosystem change, resource sustainability, development, great power competition. Uh, it's a new dynas dynamism that is inherently challenging to the traditional US goals of peace, stability, and equitable growth. Among the regions most impacted by this dynamism are those that rely to a great extent on marine resources as a major part of their natural wealth. Fish is both the dietary staple and quite literally the coin of the realm for much of the developing world. Threats to this resource therefore matter in increasingly relevant ways as does the competition for its use and trade. IEU fishing is among the most vexing of these challenges. It presents both a direct threat to maritime resources by inhibiting sustainable management, but more broadly when supported as a de facto state policy as it is by many coastal states, it presents another significant crack in the already stressed infrastructure of global norms and collective governance that we've relied on for the last 75 years. Meeting these challenges will require us to forthrightly engage with the strategic implications of the IAE threat. It will require new global commitments to transparency and collective management on the high seas. It will require the US to recognize and support the importance of this issue for many of our partners and allies, and that we assist in new ways with data sharing and enforcement. And lastly, it will require a strong response to those states that continue engaging in sometimes predatory behavior while disregarding global norms and responsible use of marine resources. So let's dive a little deeper on what I mean and let's start with this idea of dynamism. So I'm gonna share my screen now, hopefully this works, all right? <clears throat> so just quickly, I wanna show some uh, uh, information from the recent IPCC report on oceans in the cryosphere. So this is just a, uh, a few snapshots, we don't have to pay too much attention to the details here, but just look at the trends. And what we have here, this is ocean heat content over time. So this is one of the aspects of global warming that we don't talk about enough, which is this idea that the oceans act as a reservoir for heat that buffer those of us on the surface uh, from the, the greatest dramatic changes in temperature. Um, but the ocean is not an infinite buffer. It keeps absorbing that heat over time and it too warms over time. And that has dramatic implications on ecosystems and ecosystem productivity. And what this is showing is under the best scenarios, that is RCP 2.6 of the IPCC, that's sort of the most optimistic scenario, if you will, the average change in uh, fish production over time under the scenario. And what you can see here is that even in the rosiest of pictures, fish uh, productivity in the middle latitudes um, and, and I'm sorry, uh, tropical latitudes will decrease by as much as 10% over the next 50 years. Now, if we were to actually look at some of the more um, uh, scary scenarios, including the one that we're currently uh, on, uh, which is sort of the moderate track of emissions, uh, that number of decreased productivity approaches 50% for uh, coastal states in the tropical region. As you might imagine, that's a dramatic drop off and seriously threatens lives and livelihoods. But of course, it's not just local uh, issues under the situations. Um, Fish is a global commodity and it feeds the world in many respects. This is a graph of uh, increasing global population. We're heading towards something like 11 billion people by the middle of the century, uh, it's at the end of the century. Um, and it's also showing here average per capita fish consumption. And what's fascinating about this to me is that the rate of increase in per capita seafood consumption is increasing faster than the global population. Not only are we eating more fish because there are more people, more people are eating fish. 
So that of course translates to an increase in demand, which is, this is data from the FAO. And what you can see is a steady increase in demand for seafood uh, from all sources over time. Now, if you dive a little deeper, what you see is that of that demand for seafood, an increasing percentage is coming from aquaculture, that is farm raised fish. But of course, it's not so simple as well as farm raised, it's not coming from the sea, because in fact, a lot of those farm raised fish are dependent on seafood that gets turned into fish meal or other kinds of, of feed stock. But if you look closer here, if you look at that uh, blue color there, I'll go to the next slide. The center line is what the FAO is telling us is the total wild caught catch over time. And if you look, it's really leveled off since the 90s. And in fact, in recent years has begun to decrease. Now, there's something else this graph tells us here. What I'm showing you in the middle line is the FAO estimates of reconstructed catch, something about like 85 million metric tons or so for the past decade. Um, but that's not the actual catch. And if we, uh, that, sorry, that's the reported catch there. What we, if we look at actual market data, what we find is that the actual catch is something like 30 to 35% greater than the reported catch. That's the reconstructed catch there. And that the estimates, if you look at the error bars, could be significantly even higher than that by, by huge margins. So what's making up that difference, IE fishing? And, uh, and IE fishing here, uh, we mentioned it already as being illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. So what, what is that? What is illegal? What is unreported? What is unregulated? What, what do we mean by that? Well, illegal is, quite frankly, it means that it is violating uh, established laws, regulations, uh, sea, um, multilateral agreements uh, through regional fishery management organizations. Um, it is, by definition, illegal according to international law. But there are two other U's there that are a little more, make the whole issue a little more complicated. And, uh, and we sort of often conflate just illegal fishing with IU, but that's not the case. Uh, the first U is unreported, and that's from vessels that might otherwise be fishing legally, but which are not reporting the catch that they, that they have. Either they're hiding the catch in some, some form or fashion, um, they are underreporting it. Uh, this is an incredibly common practice and probably the greatest source of that gap between reported and actual uh, worldwide catch. The other source, or the other U, I should say, in IAU is unregulated fishing. And this is a really pernicious one that we, we really don't often talk about. We talk about illegal because um, it's something that we can sort of very tangible when somebody is, is fishing in another country's exclusive economic zone without rights of access. We talk about unreported because we can talk about things like a, a state actor that maybe is unreporting their catch to an international fishery organization. But unregulated fishing is fishing that happens in parts of the world ocean that are unregulated, that have no managing governance, the high seas, or a part of the high seas that might otherwise have a regional fishery management organization, but where those uh, uh, management measures that that RFMO have are weak. So if you put these together, you get IEU. And uh, as mentioned in that, in that first chart of total catch, it could potentially make up as much as one third of the global seafood trade. So this is not just a minor issue. This is not some minor concern. This is essentially a major part of the global market of seafood. That's 26 million tons of fish. It's about $23 billion. And that's just off the dock in value of fish. If you look at the total market value, that number skyrockets up to $50 billion a year. And it presents all sorts of different kinds of risk. I like to break the kinds of risk down in two broad categories of acute and strategic. When I talk about acute risk, I'm talking about uh, issues like uh, you might see in the South China Sea. Uh, we, we've seen over the last several years, China using a maritime militia of fishing vessels to blockade um, other navies within the South China Sea to prevent access from um, islands such as uh, uh, Subi Reef or in the Spratlys. Um, you have uh, instances of Indonesia uh, blowing up fishing vessels that have been encroaching in its uh, waters. Uh, Argentina recently did the same to a Chinese fishing vessel. These are actual sources of potential conflict. Uh, in Southeast Africa, you have uh, situations where um, piracy and IEU are, are tightly intertwined. Um, as Mike mentioned at the top, human rights issues are often intertwined with IEU uh, uh, risk. Um, we'll get more into that in a minute. I know Karen's going to talk about that uh, later, so I won't belabor the point, but um, essentially these are intertwined issues. Uh, human rights abuses at sea and IEU go hand in hand. And then obviously economic and food security challenges. Uh, if you are 
a developing coastal state and a foreign power is taking most of your fish, that prevents huge challenges to you on both those fronts. But there are other strategic issues here, um, either from the perspective of a great power like the US or from a developing state. For a developing state, I like to think of this in terms of sovereignty, sustainability, and security. If you can't maintain sovereignty of your own coastal resources, it's very hard for you to manage them sustainably. And if you can't manage your own coastal resources sustainably, then you're ultimately facing a deep security risk. For the United States, if we are not supporting our partners in achieving those three S's, then we are not being an effective partner and they may look elsewhere uh, for support. So thinking about this, there are different ways that um, IU can manifest. Obviously we talked about illegal, unreported and unregulated, but you can either have that occurring at sort of the local or regional scales from uh, artisanal or, or local fishing fleets on the left there is a picture of the famous Vietnamese blue boats that are famous for engaging in IE fishing across Southeast Asia and into the Western Pacific. Um, these are vessels that are uh, uh, manned by fishing crews that go um, relatively far at sea for how small the vessels are uh, and can have locally a very large impact, but we don't think of them as being a major threat to global um, food security. Distant water fishing fleets, on the other hand, are often state-sponsored either in actual fact or through large subsidies. Um, and these are fleets that will travel the world um, to uh, either produce seafood for uh, the home market or for export. One of the ways that uh, distant water fleets operate or operate effectively, because it's a very expensive proposition, is through the uh, use of transshipment vessels where fish is caught uh, at sea uh, by a fisher vessel and then uh, transshipped at sea onto a large reefer vessel. And this allows the uh, actual fishing vessels to stay at sea for um, up to three years at a time, which of course leads into potential for uh, human rights abuses and other, other issues. This process also allows the commingling of illegal and, and legally caught fish, makes it very hard uh, to, to, see, to track seafood through the supply chain. Uh, and is uh, generally one of the biggest challenges when trying to deal with IEU fishing. So if we look at where this is happening, these are IEU uh, or transshipment hotspots and, and in red are, are what we might call suspected IEU events. And you can see the wide distribution of these fleets as well as the wide distribution of transshipment events across the globe. Just briefly on human rights abuses, uh, the reason we talk about this as being so intertwined is, is in large part because of this uh, transshipment mechanism. Um, labor is the biggest cost of fishing far and away. And one of the best ways to cut down your labor force or labor costs, of course, is to engage in uh, labor abuses. Um, so I'll leave it there and just say that I know Karen Staus is going to talk about this a little bit. But, but again, IU and, and human rights abuses at sea are really intertwined. So back to distant water fishing. Um, there are really just a few nations that have uh, uh, that dominate this, this industry. Um, China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Spain. The US has a very, very small distant water fishing fleet, primarily in the Western Pacific for tuna. Um, and uh, we have something like 35 vessels and, and we rank sixth on this list. So you can see that, uh, that this is a, a big gap in, in the level of effort here. Um, to say far and away here, really the top two, China and then Taiwan, dominate together producing about 60% of the total effort for, for uh, distant water fleets. So turning to China, um, what's driving this? Well, their demand for seafood has really exploded over the last uh, 20 years. And what's interesting though is unlike the US where our demand has exploded uh, and we've gone from really a producing nation for, for fish to an importing nation for fish, imports and exports have kept pace for China. And what that means is they've had to develop their distant water fleet. And so as you can see, a dramatic explosive growth in their distant water fleet really in the last 10 years, to the point now where it's about 3,000 vessels, potentially a little more, uh, depending on how you count uh, regional fleets. Uh, and they make up 40% of the total distant water fishing by effort across the globe. This is supported by a network of foreign fishing bases um, Mike mentioned at the top uh, the potential base in Djibouti. There are a number of these bases already in place or in development uh, around the globe. Uh, just last year, we tracked through a very sort of surface level survey about half a billion dollars worth of investment around the globe. Um, and uh, Chinese distant water fleet and these bases have been officially identified as part of the broader Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. 
Um, now, the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, as you may know, a, uh, China's a plan for foreign infrastructure investment, um, often viewed as a tool for soft power. And we should see uh, these disorder fishing bases uh, as also playing a role in that space. Um, so this is a, on the right here, an example from uh, Nawadabu in Mauritania. And what you can see in uh, the top right of this picture here are the local artisanal uh, fishing vessels, whereas down here is the Chinese fishing base. And these are, this is mostly dows, small canoes, that sort of thing. And then these up here are 150 foot uh, industrial trawlers. So that's the kind of difference uh, that you can see when, when China puts in a base. And what this does is not only does it provide a large footprint for fishing effort, uh, but it also enables essentially uh, a, a closed route into the seafood supply chain. So fish that is caught by China's fleet can offload into these this, uh, uh, fishing bases and then import directly back into China. So this enables a, a strong degree of opacity, a lack of transparency uh, in these arrangements. So I'm going to close here just thinking quickly about policy solutions, then uh, certainly we should move to our other um, speakers. Um, we should be thinking about how we support management in developing states. Um, that's a key part of this process. Uh, you know, how we can improve market access controls, either through uh, uh, for, for port states, for um, uh, states that, that are um, landing uh, seafood, but also for market states like the U.S. and how we control access to our markets uh, for seafood. Regional enforcement cooperatives are incredibly important if we think about uh, maritime piracy as an uh, uh, analogous challenge, uh, looking to that for solutions. Multilateral versus bilateral ocean governance, we want to encourage multilateral governments. Bilateral ocean governance tends to be opaque. We have multilateral instruments that we can uh, use at hand, port states, Cape Town agreement, subsidy negotiations, and increase transparency through expanded use of AS and other technologies. So I'll close there. Thank you. Wit, thank you very much. That was excellent. I really appreciate the very thorough overview. The slides were super helpful too. So thank you very much for taking some time to kind of lay the foundation for us and explain the scope of this really wicked problem um, or challenge, I guess, is, is the best way to, to phrase it. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our, our two panelists who will be joining Wit. Mavish Mada joined the Department of State's Office of the Legal Advisor in 2012. She currently serves as an attorney advisor in the Office of the Assistant Legal Advisor for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. In this role, she advises on matters relating to the development, negotiation, and application of international and domestic law involving the fisheries aspect of the law of the sea, regional fisheries management organizations, port state measures, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing fishery enforcement and U.S. marine life embargoes, as well as migratory birds. It's a, it's a big portfolio, Mavish. <laughs> She's joined by Ms. Karen Staus, who serves as Senior Policy Counsel for the U.S. Department of Justice's Human Trafficking Protection Unit. Karen works on legislative and executive branch policy proposals affecting the capacity of the unit and of the U.S. Attorney's offices to prosecute trafficking and supports building capacity among HTPU's enforcement partners. Since August 2019, Karen has also served on a part-time detail to the Office of the Deputy Attorney General to support department-wide and interagency anti-trafficking coordination. And with that, Mavish, could you please give us some better insight into some of the relevant international agreements in the context of IUU fishing? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Michael, for that introduction and to the Stockton Center for hosting us virtually today. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about IUU fishing. Um, Michael and Witt touched on some of the reasons why IUU fishing is important, and just to underscore those points, um, it's important because it can undermine the science and sustainability of fish, fish stocks. It can also lead to the loss, both short and long term, of economic opportunities and to negative effects on food security and the environment. Um, although IUU fishing is not a crime under U.S. law, um, as Whit mentioned, it intersects with many other activities that are crimes um, like money laundering, drug trafficking and human trafficking, including forced labor. Um, we certainly see those trends in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, ultimately, IUU fishers avoid the operational costs associated with sustainable fisheries management, and they put legal producers at a disadvantage. 
Um, the resulting global losses are in, nearly impossible to quantify, but some estimates place it at billions or tens of billions of dollars each year. Um, so in terms of what um, the Department of State is doing um, to develop tools to combat IUU fishing, um, we work closely with a variety of interagency partners, including NOAA, Coast Guard, and the Department of Justice to level the playing field for U.S. industry by promoting our best practices and advocating for the adoption of measures that match our high domestic standards. Um, so to that end, we negotiate uh, the, the bilateral and multilateral agreements that make up the global legal framework um, for international fisheries management. So um, because of this, there's a number of different tools that apply from the high seas through EEZs and in ports um, to combat IUU fishing and ensure that the fish and seafood that make it into restaurants and kitchens around the world um, today is legally caught. Um, so I'll start with the high seas. Um, contrary to the narrative that the high seas are lawless zones where anything goes, um, there are rules that apply. Much of the basis for modern fisher fisheries governance today derives from and expands on the framework that's laid out in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, that convention specifically addresses highly migratory species, straddling stocks, and anadromous stocks in its provision on cooperation between states um, with a view to, toward the conservation and management of these stocks. Um, additionally, the United States, along with 91 other parties, have joined the agreement for the implementation of the provisions of the Convention of 10 December 1982 relating to the conservation and management of straddling fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks, which is a mouthful, um, but it's otherwise known as the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. Um, under that agreement, um, there are overarching rules uh, that establish um, the operation of sub-regional and regional fisheries management organization, or RFMOs, um, which uh, Witt touched on. Um, it has provisions on everything from scientific research to the duties of flag and port states to enforcement and dispute resolution. Um, so in terms of uh, RFMOs, the United States has worked over many decades to establish a network of these um, treaty-based multilateral bodies that oversee the cooperative and sustainable management of shared fish stocks and other living marine resources. Um, some RFMOs have geographic mandates, others have um, species-specific mandates. Um, and through these organizations, member states and jurisdictions coordinate on the scientific study of shared fisheries resources. They establish, um, importantly, conservation and management measures to manage them, and they undertake um, cooperative fisheries monitoring and enforcement activities. There are a number of, to of tools that I, um, RFMOs have at their disposal to combat IUU fishing. Um, these include IUU vessel lists and high seas boarding and inspection regimes. A good example of an RFMO um, that has both of these um, in the Indo-Pacific region is the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Management Commission or WCPFC. Um, so RFMOs like WCPFC that have IUU vessel lists will keep track of vessels that have engaged in IUU fishing in the areas that are managed um, by that RFMO. And then the commission members to which those vessels um, are flagged are then required to take action, um, including um, uh, against the vessel. And um, these measures also include requirements about submitting information on enforcement activities um, that the uh, that the um, member may undertake, including um, any imposition of sanctions against uh, the, the vessels that are on the list. Um, under high seas boarding and inspection measures, um, the members of these commissions may carry out um, boarding and inspection, as you would guess, on, uh, on the high seas of fishing vessels that are engaged in or reported to have engaged in fishing um, that is subject to the relevant convention. Um, and they do these boardings to ensure that the fishing is being conducted in accordance with um, the conservation and management measures of that organization. So these regimes often have some pretty detailed procedures regarding um, which vessels may be boarded, um, notification to the flag state and RFMO of the boarding, guidelines for the inspectors, and um, instructions to, for the masters of the fishing vessels themselves. Um, in a nutshell, uh, management and enforcement are two of the primary contributions that RFMOs um, have made to 
uh, international cooperation on fisheries. Um, in terms of other mechanisms, um, bilateral maritime law enforcement or shipwriter agreements were mentioned earlier. These offer states tools for deterrence. Um, these agreements can be used to target um, anything from drug smuggling, migrant smuggling, and illicit transport of weapons, as well as IUU fishing. And with respect to IUU fishing, these agreements recognize that um, management and enforcement in EEZs is the primary responsibility of coastal states, which are the um, first line of defense against IUU fishing. Um, but these agreements sort of act as a force multiplier that can strengthen their capacity and extend, expand their um, capability to deter IUU fishing. So for example, um, the US has agreements with other states and that allows us um, to provide US vessel and aircraft platforms and our expertise for joint patrol, boarding and inspection operations with other cooperative, um, along with other cooperative activities. Um, so the law enforcement officials called ship riders from each party um, can then embark on the vessels of the other party to um, authorize and insist the local officials during um, a boarding and inspection of a suspect fish, uh, a suspect vessel of that ship riders nationality on the high seas. Um, and it also can um, allow them to um, board any flagged vessels within waters under the jurisdiction of the ship rider country's nationality. Um, so after the boarding is complete, usually a boarding report is submitted to the coastal state for follow-up action um, uh, in terms of whether it violates the, their domestic law. Um, and if the boarding occurs on the high seas, um, the boarding report is generally sent to both the flag state and to the RFMO. Um, getting a little bit closer to land, um, within ports, increasingly states are also cooperating um, to ensure that only legitimately captured fish um, makes it through their ports, um, through systems of inspection. Um, the gold standard for this is the agreement on port state measures to prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, this entered into force in June 2016. There are currently 66 parties, and they include many countries from the Asia Pacific region, including many major seafood producers. The focus of this agreement is on um, preventing fishing vessels from landing IUU caught fish in ports. And it works to keep those products out of commerce. Um, the parties uh, designate certain ports for fishing vessels and request, um, those vessels then have to request entry. Um, they're also required to provide um, specific information to the port authorities um, that allows the port authorities to then conduct inspect inspections of those vessels and deny entry or use of port to vessels where they have um, proof that IUU fishing has occurred. Um, additionally, the agreement provides for cooperation in terms of information exchange um, and uh, on, on the inspection results. Um, additionally, through that agreement, um, we also provide uh, technical and capacity building assistance either directly or through appropriate international bodies um, to enhance the ability of developing states to implement um, port state measures. And in addition to the PSMA, um, many RFMOs either have or are moving toward adopting um, measures that track with the PSMA. Um, and sometimes those measures uh, will be used by RFMOs in conjunction, in conjunction with IUU vessel lists to identify um, vessels for inspection. Um, Finally, in terms of um, the U.S. market, um, there are a number of ways that um, there are a number of of programs that the United States employs, but I'll sort of touch on one of them. Um, these are generally risk based traceability programs, and one of them is the seafood seafood monitoring import import program um, that tracks seafood from harvest to entry into commerce. Um, it's established, it has record keeping requirements for certain types of fish and fish products. Um, priority species are cover everything from abalone, dolphin fish, mahi mahi, shrimp, king crab, um, snapper, uh, cod, um, and the list goes on. Um, so the U.S. does outreach and support for countries who are seeking to export food to the United States under this program, um, in, as well as um, training. Um, it's one of it's one part of a full suite of traceability programs um, that sort of go from sea to table. Um, I will conclude by just saying that the variety of approaches outlined here um, demonstrate the increasing creativity of the international community in adapting tools to meet the challenges of 
IUU fishing and sustainable fisheries management. Um, they cover a large geographic as well as method methodological scope. Um, and we um, encourage states to increase participation in and awareness of these efforts because that can only have a positive effect for um, conservation and management of fish stocks um, around the world. And I'll uh, end there. Mavish, thank you very much. That was that was excellent. S super technical, right? Like there are so many different moving pieces with this. Um, you've got, you know, domestic law considerations and international legal considerations and multilateral treaties, and bilateral agreements. There's just a lot of a lot of a lot of pieces to keep track of. It's uh, it, it's definitely one of the reasons that this issue is so, so complicated. Um, I wrote a little bit about it at my uh, my time at Brookings. And um, I was, I, I didn't really know too much about it before I kind of dove in and rolled my sleeves up. And I was just staggered by how much background you really need to get into to, to speak intelligently about, about this issue holistically. So thank you very much for that great overview on the, uh, the, the international legal frameworks that are in play. Karen, um, both all three of us have kind of teased your presentation a little bit. I'm really looking forward to hear to hear what you have to say and to, to get in get in deep on some of the associated criminal aspects that we see along with uh, with IUU fishing. So with that, please, please take it away. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Great. Thank you, Captain Sinclair. And thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm Karen Staus. I'm Senior Policy Counsel with the Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit at the U.S. Department of Justice. And we are, as a headquarters unit that is composed of subject matter experts on human trafficking, we collaborate with the 93 U.S. Attorney's Offices around the country to prosecute human trafficking. And we focus on those cases that are complex, novel, and multi-jurisdictional. In, that involve either forced labor or sex trafficking by force, fraud, or coercion. So my presentation today is going to be really heavily based on the content of a Department of Justice report that we submitted to Congress just four months ago. Um, Congress had directed us at DOJ to convene an interagency task force that would analyze legal and jurisdictional issues related specifically to human trafficking in fishing in international waters and to make any recommendations that would address gaps. Um, and, and I think an important contribution of the report actually is a very lengthy appendix that accompanies the report, which is a table detailing a very wide range of relevant authorities agency by agency. Um, so if you are a lawyer interested in this area, hopefully you will enjoy geeking out with this um, table appendix to the report. Um, the report and appendix are available on the DOJ and State Department websites, and I can drop a link into the chat for anyone who's interested. Um, the next steps now that the report has been submitted to Congress with recommendations is that both Congress and the administration and executive branch agencies can consider those recommendations and set priorities among them. Um, I do just want to mention that the interagency partners that made really significant contributions to this report included the U.S. Coast Guard, NOAA, the Department of State and USAID, Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, Labor, Treasury, and the U.S. Trade Representative. So um, today I would like to first describe the problem of human trafficking in fishing in international waters. Um, I know that some might not be familiar with it. I will just highlight the U.S. government's existing legal authorities to address human tra trafficking and then some of the gaps in those authorities. And then um, hopefully we will have time during the Q&A to share in a little bit more detail some of the key recommendations that the that our interagency task force made in order to address some of those gaps. So to start with, um, human trafficking is one of a range of serious crimes that are committed at sea. Um, for those who are interested in learning more, um, there is a, in, in a more compelling and readable format, maybe those who don't enjoy geeking out on <laughs> those types of legal uh, statute, statutory tables, I really commend the book Outlaw Oceans by Ian Urbina and his ongoing journalism on this topic, which is called the Outlaw Oceans Project. 
um, which you can find online. Um, that covers the broader range of crimes, but my remarks will focus specifically on the crime of human trafficking in fishing, which is the focus of the report that I've mentioned. So human trafficking in general encompasses both forced labor, sometimes known as labor trafficking, as well as sex trafficking. Um, we'll be focused on forced labor today. So um, under US law, what is forced labor? Um, it is securing labor or services through the use of force or coercion. And the criminal prohibition is at 18 US code section 1589. The concept of coercion um, is extremely important. And it really covers any scheme that would cause a reasonable person in the victim's particular situation to fear that they or someone else would suffer serious harm if the person did not continue to provide the labor. So it's important to notice that human trafficking does not require crossing of international borders. It does not require transportation. It does not even require movement. Um, so human trafficking is not human smuggling. Um, I do also want to note that um, our report, as, as, as um, the prior speakers have also mentioned, our report does draw the connection between unsustainable fishing practices and human trafficking. Um, distant water fishing, um, and in particular, um, unsustainable fishing that occurs on distant water fishing vessels, uh, by definition, is occurring farther out to sea. So it's more difficult to investigate, to detect crimes. And because of the added costs of distant water fishing, there is a pressure to reduce costs. And unfortunately, this makes forced labor more attractive to unscrupulous actors in order to reduce costs. And one of the things that we have seen is that the transshipment of catch at sea or transferring the catch from one type of vessel to a different type of vessel at sea, allowing those distant water fishing vessels to remain at sea rather than enter ports um, is one important indicator of potential human trafficking. Um, the, the working conditions on those vessels that stay at sea for weeks or even months at a time are very likely to be degraded. And um, degraded working conditions is one of the places where you may find uh, human trafficking victims. So I do want to note that um, U.S. government investigative agencies have not identified human trafficking on U.S. fishing vessels. But our report does recognize that um, based on conditions in some U.S. fleets, there is a notable risk of human trafficking on U.S. vessels. I just want to give an example of the experience reported by two Indonesian fishers who brought a civil lawsuit against a U.S. vessel employer in 2016. So this was not a criminal case, but a civil lawsuit. And the description of their experiences is in many ways typical of what we see globally in human trafficking fishing cases. And this case is known as Sorayan versus the Sea Queen 2. Um, so these two Indonesian fishers had entered into what they believed was a legitimate contract to work as tuna fishermen aboard an American vessel. They entered that contract when they were still at home. Um, and several characteristics of this case are very common to forced labor in distant water fishing in other fleets globally, and also to forced labor cases generally that, that we've seen in the United States and globally. In other words, outside of the fishing sector as well. Um, so very high recruitment fees leading to debt. These are worker paid recruitment fees, costs that workers are paying in order to access jobs. Um, now this debt becomes very important. Um, the recruitment of workers from impoverished countries or impoverished, impoverished areas within countries is very common. And the threat of debt acts very powerfully um, because there are little to no other options to earn the amount of money necessary to pay off those debts in most cases. So um, for those of us who have, you know, Western 
brains, we often think in terms of physical violence and physically violent crimes being the most serious crimes. But in many parts of the world where hunger or homelessness are constantly just possibilities around the corner, the threat of financial ruin acts far more powerfully than um, um, than certain types of physical violence. Um, also, these two fishermen were deceived about the work, and there was a sort of a bait and switch with respect to the nature of the job. Um, they had signed one contract with um, certain promising certain payment and certain conditions. And then later on, after they had left home, after they had traveled away from home, after they were no longer able to just bail on the situation, the agent asked them to sign a different contract. And this contract had a $1,000 US, pen, US dollars, um, $1,000 penalty if they failed to complete their two-year contract term. So in other words, no matter how bad the conditions might get, they would owe the equivalent of about two and a half months wages um, if they decided to leave the work early. These two workers also faced um, hazardous and unsafe working conditions <coughs> and a lack of access to medical care when they were injured. Also, isolation is a feature of all of these distant water fishing cases. It's a feature in many forced labor cases, but especially in these cases <clears throat> where the workers are not even allowed to leave their vessel when they enter ports because they don't have the appropriate visa. And that's what these workers, um, these two workers were facing. And last but not least, their passports were confiscated. So very often we see documents being withheld as a means of preventing um, workers from escaping situations if they do happen to be in a port where they could actually leave the vessel. So in this case, um, the parties reached a settlement in 2018 for an undisclosed amount. Um, but under the settlement agreement, the, the vessel operator agreed to adopt and implement a code of conduct to protect future workers and also to distribute a know your rights flyer to all of the workers that are employed in the future on this vessel. So um, now I wanna talk about what, what are the United States government legal authorities? What can the US government do to address human trafficking in fishing in international waters? Um, what already can be done and what actions would require legislative changes or executive branch policy decisions? And those are the questions that we tried to answer with our report. There we go. Um, so the, the way we organized our report was um, recognized that the answers to these questions are very different depending on whether we are talking about U.S. vessels or foreign vessels. And so the report, which addresses authorities, gaps, and then recommendations, is structured in such a way to review these questions separately with respect to U.S. vessels first, then foreign vessels whose catch actually enters the United States, where we have fewer um, options, but still some very important and significant options to address the problem of human trafficking. And then last, the report looks at what we can do related to foreign vessels whose catch um, never actually enters the United States. So first on United States vessels, um, we can criminally prosecute forced labor on U.S. vessels. Um, we can prosecute the captain if they're involved in the forced labor. And we also have the potential to prosecute downstream actors in the supply chain for those vessels. Um, when fish is caught outside the United States, even on a U.S. vessel, um, it is for customs purposes still considered an import. And so it can be subject to the U.S. legal prohibition against importation of goods produced in whole or in part with forced labor. Um, that importation prohibition is at 19 U.S. Code 1307. It's enforced by Customs and Border Protection. Um, so NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement can board U.S. vessels and um, also requires some U.S. vessels to carry observers. 
Um, U.S. Coast Guard also can board U.S. vessels when in the United States or international waters to enforce United States laws. Um, and it's also important to note that we do have victim assistance mechanisms, and that's whether the victims ultimately, um, at the time that they're needing assistance, are located in the United States or overseas, perhaps back in their home countries. Um, so we do have some of these authorities, but the there are a number of gaps even in addressing U.S. vessels. Um, and really, I think the most significant gap that I would want to highlight today is actually our ability simply to detect the presence of forced labor, even on U.S. vessels. So um, I mentioned before, we so far have not actually detected forced labor on U.S. vessels, even though we know that there are significant risks on U.S. vessels. There are debt issues that I described earlier that are quite common in some fleets. And also there is a structural situation where foreign workers on U.S. fishing vessels um, that are in the high seas, that are not you know, in the internal waters of the U.S., those vessels, unlike other U.S. employers, do not need to secure United States worker visas in order to employ workers on the U.S. vessels, which means, as I alluded earlier, that even when those U.S. vessels come into U.S. ports, the workers on those vessels are not allowed to leave the port areas except in certain um, specific situations if they get some type of humanitarian leave. And that, of course, depends on the captain. Well, if you have an unscrupulous captain, they're not going to give them that type of, of leave. Um, and that's what happened to the two fishers in the case that I mentioned, where um, one of them was injured and still was not allowed to leave the, the vessel. Um, to seek medical care. So we also have fewer clear avenues to detect. So in addition to just the physical isolation that goes along with distant water fishing, um, there are certain laws that generally protect workers in the U.S. that are not extended to U.S. vessels. So fishing workers on U.S. vessels that are working in international waters do not have wage and hour protections. They're within a complete area of exception to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, there are some occupational safety and health provisions that apply to those workers, but they are very minimally applied and they're split across two agencies, which has sort of led to a situation where unfortunately um, they just very often are not being applied. And so the detection of forced labor on these vessels is dependent on reports, which would come either from the workers, very unlikely, as we've you know been speaking about the conditions that the workers are in, um, or uh, some other witness, whether a U.S. government official who sees something suspicious or any other person who might be encountering these workers. And again, you know, given the given the nature of the industry, we're talking about these types of reports or you know tips about criminal violations and especially forced labor are highly unlikely. So um, turning to vessels whose catch enters, so foreign vessels whose catch enters the United States. Um, the United States does potentially have criminal jurisdiction over forced labor on those vessels. Um, we do have extraterritorial jurisdiction over human trafficking crimes, but it is dependent on the connection of the potential defendant to the United States. Um, we also have what I mentioned earlier, um, the customs prohibition on importation of goods produced in whole or in part with forced labor, meaning whether it's, you know, the whole fish that was produced with forced labor that's being imported, that is prohibited, but also even if, um, you know, fish is incorporated into some other product, that product cannot be imported into the United States if the fish within that product was um, caught using forced labor. Um, as far as some of the, the key gaps in this area, um, there are similar, of course, issues to detection, um, even fewer opportunities for U.S. government officials to potentially detect um, forced labor. And 
um, U.S. enforcement agencies, such as Coast Guard, um, only can board when there is some form of consent by the vessel or by the foreign government that flagged the vessel. Um, but as um, the prior speakers were describing, most of the relevant boarding agreements between the United States and foreign governments relate to suspected fisheries violations um, they do not cover human trafficking crimes. There is one RFMO that has a non-binding um, agreement to address forced labor issues, but it's, it hasn't extended to this type of mutual agreement to um, potentially detect and enforce against human trafficking or forced labor crimes on the vessels. Um, so last but not least, um, the foreign vessels whose catch does not enter the United States. In those cases, we have even fewer options for US government action, um, but we're, we're not altogether helpless there either. Um, we have diplomatic options and foreign assistance strategies, um, some of which were also described by other speakers in terms of um, negotiation of our FMOs or other kinds of bilateral agreements that could potentially um, incorporate uh, addressing uh, forced labor. So um, I will stop there for now, but I do want to, to note that our report included 27 high-level recommendations. Um, some of those recommendations were to Congress and they would require legislative change. Um, those, all those recommendations were agreed by consensus among the agencies participating in the task force. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to go into more detail on some of them during the Q&A. Um, I will drop a link to the report in the chat, like I mentioned. Um, but it's also, I want to note that some of our high-level recommendations were actually, in a sense, recommendations to ourselves. We were identifying actions that the executive branch could take, even in the absence of legislative action by Congress, in order to um, strengthen our ability to address forced labor and fishing in international waters. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was an excellent overview of the, the tools that the United States has available um, and the challenges of dealing with um, forced labor and to some extent uh, trafficking associated with IUU fishing. Thank you. I, I appreciate the, the excellent overview and discussion there. So we have just under 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to tee those up and I would ask the the respondents to please be brief in their to please be brief in their responses. And I first would like to start with a question. It's kind of a technical question for uh, for Wit, and it's from Andy Surdy. He notes that the Chinese distant water fishing fleet in uh, operates in fifty states EEZs, and he asks if there are any. Um, active bilateral access treaties under Article 62 of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, um, and whether those uh, agreements are based on the calculation of surpluses that the, the coastal states themselves lack the capacity to catch. So can you talk a little bit just briefly on access agreements and how those help shape the uh, IUU issue? Over. Yes, great. Thank you. And, and thanks for that very insightful question. Yes, uh, in fact, that, that is entirely the basis for, for many of those agreements. And um, so that's why we, we think of IUU as being this really fuzzy term, um, because in one sense, uh, fishing under those access agreements would not fit IUU. In, in fact, it is um, uh, un UNCLOS requires uh, signatory nations to provide that kind of access uh, to access the, uh, the undeveloped resource, if you will. Uh, the problem with those kinds of agreements, and particularly when you have a nation like China engaging that kind of bilateral access agreement, um, they often tend to be incredibly opaque uh, and very unequal in their application. Um, and so you have uh, agreements that uh, uh, quite often, particularly in the case of, of West Africa, for example, uh, do not represent uh, accurately the value of the resource that is being taken out of the waters. Um, and oftentimes, uh, there is a tremendous amount of corruption that goes on with those agreements. Uh, you have a situation in a place like uh, Ghana where you do have some access uh, agreed to, but uh, none of the vessels actually fishing within Ghanaian waters are supposed to be Chinese owned uh, or foreign owned, I should say. But in actual fact, if you track beneficial ownership, 
uh, something like 90% of the fleet uh, can be traced back to, to China. So um, it, the issue with those kinds of agreements really does come down to their opacity. And then I'll add on to the fact uh, that even if you look at sort of the black and white ink, it may not be IEU uh, on paper, uh, but uh, in actual fact, you often have lots of unreported phishing that goes along with those kinds of access agreements in addition to the other inequities that, that are formed. So I'll uh, just say last thing on that is that uh, those kinds of agreements also tend to be a pathway for other kinds of influence peddling, uh, especially from a state actor like China. Great, thank you. That was an excellent response. I'm gonna throw this question out to the entire panel and I'd be curious to hear from, from all three. I, in my preliminary remarks, I talked about the general prohibition against criminalizing uh, IUU phishing that's captured in the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. I, I'd be curious as to your thoughts as to the, the pros and cons of greater potential to criminalize uh, certain aspects of IUU phishing to make it easier to prosecute, um, perhaps for grievous offenses or uh, only vessel masters. And um, Karen, as the as the justice rep, why don't you why don't you start with the with your thoughts on that? Um, actually, my expertise is really on the human trafficking crimes, so I'm not sure that I could speak generally to um, the pros and cons of criminalizing some of the other crimes related to fisheries. Um, I would defer maybe to Mavish, who might know if the U.S. government has a settled opinion on that question. Um, thanks, Karen. Yeah, I think for the most part, uh, the U.S. government is uh, not in favor of criminalizing IUU fishing. I think we all recognize that um, it's very important to address the criminal activity associated with IUU fishing, and some see criminalizing IUU fishing itself as a way to get at that. Um, we think that would be counterproductive for a number of different reasons. Um, one of them, I think one of the most more important ones, is it it sort of takes away from the role that RFMO, RFMOs play, they are not law enforcement agencies, um, but it kind of, it takes away from their expertise in fisheries management um, and puts IU fishing in more of a law enforcement space that kind of um, doesn't have as clear of a focus on the long-term sustainability of, um, of fisheries, which is really the goal. Um, and I think it also tends to sort of blur the distinctions um, between the I, the illegal part of IUU fishing and the U and the U. Um, unregulated fishing, for instance, is not, may not be illegal at all um, because it's unregulated. Um, so it, you, you kind of lose sight of, of those um, other elements and, and those are important as well. Great. And what are, what are your thoughts? You would, um, in our previous discussions, uh, in prep for this, you talked about, you know, whether interdiction alone will meet the challenge of deterrence. Um, can you can you expound on the idea on the, pro, the pros and cons of uh, increased enforcement and or interdiction? Yes, absolutely. So um, interdiction and and enforcement at sea is uh, you, you need to have the traffic cops, so to speak. You need to have the demonstrable deterrence out there. But we're never going to solve this challenge, particularly given its multifaceted and complex nature, the potential for state actors to be heavily involved, uh, for that to be a really uh, a completely effective uh, mode of, of dealing with this challenge. On the other hand, market access is uh, likely to be um, probably our best tool in the kit, if you will. Um, the EU, uh, the US and Japan together are far and away the dominant actors uh, in the seafood marketplace. Uh, the EU already has a very strong market access control scheme in place. Uh, Japan has just announced that they are putting one in place. We have one that's kind of falls somewhere between. It was already mentioned by Mavish, the Seafood Import Monitoring Program. It's what I would call maybe in its teenage years. Uh, it's uh, coming into form. Um, there are still gaps uh, in how it's applied. There are still holes in how it's uh, uh, being enforced, uh, but it's a great start. And so there are a number of things that we can do to, to step it up and, and uh, start building on the, the progress that we've made there. One of the things I would say that uh, can be built upon is improving how we define IEU across US law. It's actually defined rather unevenly. We have in a number of statutes, the IEU definition that comports with the international FAO definition, which is um, fairly broad uh, and encompasses violation of uh, international agreements, including labor agreements. 
Uh, whereas the IU definition that we actually enforce against under the Seafood Import Modeling Program is much more constrained uh, than those definitions. So I think one of the things that uh, we could do first off would be to think about how we might expand uh, that definition to be consistent and uh, compatible with international uh, definitions. To get to the question about uh, illegality, I think that uh, maybe contra a little bit to what Mavish is saying, um, once we begin to sort of think about uh, getting that enhanced definition in place, that does open up a number of other uh, options for uh, thinking about how uh, illegal imports into the U.S. might be dealt with. Um, our FMOs are excellent and supporting those kind of international management mechanisms is incredibly important. But unfortunately, our FMOs are often weak and compliance mechanisms for our FMOs also tend to be weak. So uh, the way you back that up is through market access. And if we have strong market access controls here in the U.S. and if we have strong legal uh, deterrence for importers to bring in illegally or IU associated uh, product into the U.S., uh, that can only help our FMO compliance. Excellent. With Karen Mavish, thank you so much for the excellent presentation today. I, I, I can't tell you how helpful it was for me to continue to wrap my mind around this really dynamic, really challenging issue. It was great to hear from you all today. Unfortunately, this is all that we have time for on this panel. Um, I, I believe the conclusion of the event um, We'll be kicking off here in about seven minutes with a, a presentation by the Coast Guard's Judge Advocate General, Admiral Burt. Um, and with that, Mike Petta, I'd like to turn the floor back over to you. Thanks. Captain St. Clair, Sinclair, thank you uh, so much. Dr. Son Weber, thank you. Karen Mavish, thanks for donating your time. I know you both have demanding schedules and we greatly appreciate you sharing your expertise. Uh, to the audience, it is minute 59, and I'm going to shift our break just a, a tad to the right, meaning we will start at minute 10. So 15, 10, Eastern Daylight Savings Time, we will reconvene for uh, closing remarks from Admiral Byrd. See you then. Welcome back from our break. We are about to begin the 12th and final session of our three-day conference, and Looking back over the day's discussions, I note a common theme, whether it was the SJAs talking about US military operations in the Indo-Pacific, whether it was Dr. Nasu talking about maritime militias or Professor Lalonde discussing the Northwest Passage. All of these discussions share the rule of law as a common theme. Now as a Coast Guard judge advocate, with 30 years of military service in the United States, I happen to know, I personally know, that the rule of law and rule-based order is of particular importance to the United States Coast Guard and even Coast Guards around the world. That's why it's fitting that our closing remarks will be provided by Rear Admiral Melissa Burt, the Judge Advocate General and Chief Counsel of the United States Coast Guard. You can read more about Rear Admiral Burt's extensive career in the biographical information in the online program. For Admiral Burt, welcome. And uh, I turn the floor over to you, ma'am. Thank you. I feel really honored to be part of this important conference. And I really would like to offer my thanks and appreciation to uh, Professor Kraska, Chair of the Stockton Center, Rear Admiral Chatfield, President of the War College, and, uh, and also for my Coast Guard brethren who have been really supporting all of this. And uh, it's clearly, this is so important to all of us that this leadership uh, of the Stockton Center continuing this dialogue about international maritime governance, uh, it's so necessary more now than I, I would say ever. Uh, it's been a, a scary time for, um, for this country and for this world. Uh, the past few years, it just seems to be growing and growing in, uh, in uh, threats. Um, when we talk about the world, uh, we all have different perspectives of uh, what, the, what the world looks like. From the Coast Guard's world, we, uh, we were thinking about like the Bering Straits because of the, the fishing to uh, McMurdo because we do, uh, we do uh, the breaking out the ice uh, to allow scientists to get 
uh, their work done, the Galapagos, and that's another uh, fishing issue, and uh, as well as drugs, uh, Madagascar. Um, the geography of the Indo-Pacific region cuts across, obviously, many uh, cultures, uh, continents, and uh, and really the artificial boundaries of the combatant commands. And uh, that was very apparent when I was at uh, Northern Command, uh, because you see how uh, commands are supposed to handle issues that are um, impacting their AOR, but their AORs really don't have anything to do with what the issues are. So uh, it's a really, this is a very dynamic time. And of course, uh, there's only one thing that brings us all together or can bring us all together, and that's the rule of law. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's something that uh, Colonel McCann already talked a lot about, but um, I want to just mention that it's very, uh, it's really special to be doing this uh, here, well, for you all there <laughs> um, at the War College, because the um, as I understand, it was 1901 when uh, you first came together to, to discuss these issues. And that effort uh, resulted in the very first volume of the Naval War College's law journal, uh, the International Law Studies. And it's noteworthy that at the very beginning of that, the preface uh, talked about the value of bringing to bear a mutual discussion, thought and experience of those who make uh, the application of the law and the trained mind of the international jurist. And so here it is uh, 120 years later, and that tradition of engaging in uh, peaceful discourse and mutual discussion uh, and, finding and finding solutions to the maritime challenges uh, that continues today. And what, what an honor to be part of that tradition. Uh, the other thing that, you know, we talk about a lot and all of us in our in our environments are talking about diversity of perspectives. And uh, sometimes that's uh, that's seen as like an artificial uh, introduction to people. And the reality is that is exactly what we uh, we need and we benefit from. And it exists in all of our debates, whether people notice it or not. Um, in the last three days, we've had uh, armed forces uh, jurists, we've had uh, government uh, government uh, professionals, attorneys, uh, and and other uh, scholars. We've also benefited from the perspectives of ten different countries, legal minds from ten different countries. So that is diversity of perspective, and it is so important to us moving forward. We've also had. Uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace have participated and uh, the UN International Law Commission and uh, of course academia. So the, the conference participants, you are what makes this such a, uh, a useful conference because you span geography, gender, cultures, and worldviews and you're bringing a discussion that is so much more valuable to uh, our understanding of the law and also how we can move forward. The um, they're only the only answer to the stability and security, the instability and the security challenges we're facing now is the rule of law. There's nothing else that can can unify us or 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 get us on the same page. And yet it's really it's really been under attack uh, more and more. And I'm, you know, I was really thrilled to see that the, the president's, uh, President Biden, who, by the way, spoke at the Coast Guard Academy for graduation today. So it was very exciting for us to have the president there. But uh, he, he issued a national security strategy uh, guidance, which is only interim, but it makes it very clear that, uh, that international governance is critical and that what we built after World War II has to adapt. And America is uh, ideally positioned to the conversations that we need to have around the world. Um, and uh, I'm not, I don't need to read all of it, but he does uh, say, I like, I like this uh, comment, amid rapid change and mounting crises, the system's flaws and inequities are becoming apparent. Gridlock and interstate rivalry have caused many around the world, including Americans, to question uh, the relevance of global, uh, global engagement, which is just, uh, it's very sad. So the United States cannot return to business as usual. The past order cannot just be restored. 
So with our allies and partners, we can modernize the architecture of international cooperation for the challenges of this century. And that's, uh, and he says, from cyber threats to climate change, corruption, and digital authoritarianism. Uh, I will tell you from my seat as a Coast Guard Chief Counsel, I work very closely with DHS uh, pretty much every day. Um, and I will tell you the priorities and the meetings we are having are all about climate change, digital authoritarianism, uh, cyber threats. I mean, this is just, as you can imagine from the news, uh, these are very, very real issues that are the focus of this uh, administration now. And that I think is sending a signal around the world that uh, our priorities are international issues, not just American issues. So um, our, uh, we talk about our governance system. It was really you think about it, it was really to avoid these uh, world wars and or recurrence of genocides. Um, and then we were sort of adapting to the technologies in the first half of the 20th century, but that's, um, that's just not, uh, some of it is applicable, but unfortunately uh, we, have, we have so many more threats today that we never dreamed about. Uh, climate change, global health crises, uh, now, we did have, uh, obviously, the Spanish flu in the first half of the century, it, but it, it didn't, uh, it wasn't treated. I mean, it, it, today, we, we couldn't have uh, the kind of loss of life and, uh, and function uh, as they did in that, um, in the early 1900s. Uh, we have perpetual wars and just overwhelming migration flows. There, there is, uh, the migration flows are increasing uh, every every year it's not there's there are so many uh people who are unsettled um on this earth and uh there's no end in sight uh we have artificial intelligence challenges and of course we have space endeavors um peaceful but uh potentially otherwise so uh just as our military legal scholars uh work to shape international law in the past uh those with understanding of state power and training in the law, uh, we can work to shape international governance systems of the future. Uh, we, uh, we have to have cross-domain joint operations to ensure success. And this is not just the theater commands like of, a, of a World War II uh, or Goldwater Nichols saying, yes, we have to work together. Uh, we really have to think about national power and Bringing, uh, bring lethality or bring peace to bear by whole of government. It's been very challenging uh, in the past, but we're not gonna be successful unless we're bringing across an integrated diplomatic, military, economic, and information spectrum. So in the United States, as you know, we, uh, we have done this uh, tri-service maritime strategy, which talks about joint operations across the spectrum. But this is not, uh, this is just one aspect. Um, we have so many peacetime missions and we have so many missions that are uh, related to disaster that it's, it's interesting to me how much the Navy has really been a disaster responder. Uh, that was probably not envisioned in uh, World War II, but uh, much of the Navy's work now because of the tsunamis, the nuclear uh, facility, explosions, all of these things that are just new, surprising, uh, they, 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 should, they could be called black swans, but they've happened so much now, I don't know if they're, they're black swans anymore. But um, it's, uh, it's interesting how everything is bled over and we all have a role in uh, safeguarding both uh, our, you know, our countries, but just the human life around the world and global commerce, uh, there's just such a tenuous uh, tie for some of these when something bad happens. I think COVID, that's, uh, that's just such a shining example of, of how, uh, how little, so how one thing can happen and it doesn't seem like it should uh, impact so much, but it just took down the world economy and, uh, and is still... Uh, we're still reeling from it well over a year later and will be for several years. So um, as we talk about these uh, issues, uh, whether it's uh, you know, 
putting the Coast Guard with the Navy uh, for illegal drug or illegal fishing, or whether it's the Coast Guard um, embarking on, uh, or excuse me, when the Coast Guard hosts uh, ship riders from Micronesia and other countries, uh, whether it's uh, Southcom em embarking uh, maritime aircraft on international strait, or, um, you know, this is interesting to me, uh, when other countries are asking for our cyber mission forces to help them, and uh, that is happening. Um, also, when we're talking about, you know, space, space force and space comm operations, uh, you know, we, we're in a situation now in the Coast Guard where uh, we're, we have a private company basically asking for support because it's a U.S. mission that uh, is being launched from, uh, from the waters outside of our territorial seas. And that's, uh, that's presented some issues, obviously, internationally, because if we're going to uh, do enforcement in our EEZ uh, as though it were territorial seas, that sends a, a definite signal. So that's been, a, that's been just yet another challenge. Uh, we have so many challenges in this area of how the rule of law no longer applies in the same way, but we have to figure out how it should apply. So um, as we talked about the, uh, the Tri-Service Maritime strategy, um, obviously that's a huge effort to institutionalize this idea that we have to have rule of law and uh, the Coast Guard support to maritime governance and the ability to operate in the spectrum of um, the entire spectrum of operations um, is highlighted in the strategy. So it's very, uh, it was really great to see in writing that integrated naval forces are uniquely suited to, uh, for operations across the competition continuum. And uh, I'm not going to uh, go into how awesome the Coast Guard is, but, um, but you all know, because you had a, a lot of Coast Guard speakers here and uh, interacted with us. So um, the future, as it was in the past, uh, partnerships and collaboration uh, across national boundaries, international boundaries are critical to advance our national and shared interests. Modern security, stability, and prosperity uh, is a testament to what, you know, how, why this works. And it's uh, even, even with COVID, uh, the fact that we have uh, vaccines flowing around the world to help other countries uh, is, uh, it's, it's so important. Uh, and other countries are clearly doing the same uh, because you know, when, when you have a pandemic, it doesn't really um, discriminate in the way that uh, you know, people think it should. So uh, it's, it's important for the vaccines not to discriminate based on wealth and, and other things. So um, at any rate, uh, multilateral cooperation is something we've always benefited from. Uh, even uh, going back to our help from the French in the American Revolution to post-World War II uh, alliances with Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, our strength comes not just about force, uh, but it comes from this collaboration and integration on issues that are important to all of our partners. When we join together and work together on something that is, uh, is it, it helps uh, all of us. Um, I was just at a change of command and uh, uh, one of the things that the, uh, the hallmark guiding principle that the commander said was, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I, I think that's obviously said uh, probably too often, but, uh, but if we don't have that attitude, we're never going to move forward. So I, um, I, I do feel that way. We have to think about benefiting all and how we're gonna do that as opposed to just a zero sum game with every action we take. So um, as Secretary Blinken stated when he laid out a foreign policy for the American people, American leadership and engagement matter. Whether we like it or not, the world does not organize itself. When we pull back, one of two things is likely to happen. Either another country takes our place, uh, but not in a way that advances our values or interests. And maybe just as bad, no one steps up and then we have chaos and uh, that creates danger. So um, I think that's, uh, that's really telling it. Great to see our leaders uh, espouse that. 
um, and this is also interesting, not a single global challenge that affects your lives can be met by any one nation acting alone, not even one as powerful as the United States. So that's definitely a departure from where we, where we were, uh, but it's uh, very inspiring that we're going in that direction. So as we talk about that in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we have uh, obviously vast stretches of ocean that the U.S. can't control all of that. Uh, we have to have um, some incentive and some ability to ensure these, these uh, smaller uh, nations can thrive. And it's, uh, it, it's just they don't have many of these places do not have the ability to, uh, to patrol and to stop. Uh, the kinds of uh, encroachment and the, the kinds of damage that is, uh, is being done to their, their nations. So um, we're very fortunate that we've had the opportunity to enter into bilateral and multilateral agreements. The Coast Guard is particularly uh, good at this because we obviously work with the State Department and, uh, and the Department of Justice and all, all of our, our partners, but these agreements... Um, they are not seen uh, as threatening or taking a country's sovereignty. Uh, they are seen as the United States helping uh, them to, uh, to be more powerful in their own right. So they see it as an enhancement to their sovereignty. And that's, um, that's really a great feeling because certainly we don't wanna uh, appear that we're just someone else taking over uh, their their territorial seas and that kind of thing. But we, we've we been very uh, fortunate. We've had great agreements and we continue to expand those agreements to address different things. Uh, obviously they were originally uh, more on the law enforcement side for narcotics trafficking and uh, search and rescue as well. Um, oil spill response, migrant smuggling, uh, weapons of mass destruction smuggling. Um, but now we're really expanding to deal with the uh, the it, the illicit uh, fishing, so the IUU fishing, um, because that is what is impacting the stability of our Pacific uh, countries. And also, uh, we're not talking about this here, but I met with uh, AFRICOM, some AFRICOM leadership this week. And obviously, that's uh, the China concerns are the same uh, there. So uh, it's interesting that the, the things that we think of are just our issue, it's uh, it's not every. These are global issues. Um, I do want to highlight a more recent agreement uh, that we, we just signed uh, during COVID, which was exciting. Uh, but the American Institute in uh, Taiwan and the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States, which is uh, TECROS, the acronym, which you would never remember. Uh, they just signed uh, an MOU, which establishes the Coast Guard Working Group. And the point of this is to uh, basically uh, talk about our common objectives. And we do have common objectives, uh, preserving maritime resources, reducing the IUU fishing, participating in joint search and rescue, and uh, collaborating in maritime environmental response incidents. And I just, uh, I find it remarkable that, you know, across the world, you can always find uh, common goals, common ground, common interests, and, uh, and a desire to work together, international exchange, international cooperation, and even enforcement. Uh, these are things that we can do together, um, which sometimes we look at all of our differences, but there are things we can do together despite differences. Uh, we actually have over 50 bilateral agreements, and uh, and prior to uh, recent years, we even had uh, we had ship riders from uh, from China, which is hard to believe, and Russia. <laughs> so we we've done a lot of joint operations uh, up until now. Um, now we're uh, our joint operations are um, more with our friends, but uh, we do continue to keep the dialogue opened with uh, with any country who wants to discuss the types of law enforcement or maritime issues that are outside of arguing about the law of the sea, which is uh, what sometimes happens. Um, at any rate, I, uh, 
I want to mention uh, something that happened last year, which was uh, fascinating. Uh, in December of last year, the archipelagic country of Palau detected a vessel that was illegally fishing off of Helen Reef. And uh, their government dispatched a patrol boat, which was the uh, PSS President uh, Remelik II, to interdict the fishing vessel. Uh, but they asked the Coast Guard under an existing bilateral agreement uh, for assistance. And we were actually flew out. Uh, we dispatched a C-130 aircraft, which flew really slowly, but <laughs> it got there and a new fast response cutter. And we helped them board this fishing vessel. And uh, they, uh, they were able to, to detain the vessel and seize the catch and deter this thing for this from happening again. Um, Australia has supported this cooperative effort with Guardian class patrol boats. Uh, the PSS president, uh, High Remelik the second and the US Coast Guard crews uh, that assisted in the boarding operations provided technical expertise on the fisheries enforcement. So this is illustrative how, uh, how nations, how, uh, how different uh, skills and uh, authorities can be brought together in a collaborative approach, enhancing the law of the sea and, uh, and ensuring that Palau could assert its sovereignty and protect its natural resources. And this partnership uh, with Palau is not uh, just a law enforcement partnership. Uh, we also had uh, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, our, our patrol boat out there, the fast response cutter Myrtle Hazard, uh, they delivered emergency supplies, food and water to Palau after the typhoon uh, devastated that country. And uh, it's so amazing to think about how we're all over the world, even though we're the U.S. Coast Guard. But I think that's the future for all of us. Uh, guarding, guarding a white picket fence at home is, is not uh, the future. So uh, looking forward, we have to continue if we want to be successful and have a world that we want to live in, uh, we have to use partnerships, we have to collaborate, and we have to ensure that all nations have access to the global commons, and that includes freedom of navigation and over, overflight rights under international law. And the insightful conversations from the last few days have certainly advanced that cause, um, and I would encourage all in attendance, uh, scholars and leaders alike, um, that if you can bring this back to uh, where you are and continue to work uh, to refine uh, how we can uh, enhance our maritime governance system, both in peace and for war, uh, we will all benefit. So I think that this conference's impact will go on much, uh, much beyond today uh, through your efforts to bring back what you have uh, thought about and contemplated the last few days. So um, Professor Kraska, I return the floor to you. I think I'm gonna do that, but I'm not sure exactly how I do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing in a younger person because, <laughs> let's see, here we go. Uh, oh, here, probably somebody told me. Admiral, uh, nope. I've got it, Admiral. I don't know if you can hear me okay, ma'am, but I will uh, I'll take the mic. All right. Thank you. <laughs> no, ma'am. Th thank you. Thank you. You're, uh, I know you have a very demanding schedule, and uh, we are grateful. Pr uh, Professor Kraska, all of the War College is thankful, ma'am, for you uh, donating your time. Your remarks are a perfect exclamation point on the conversations we've had over the last three days. Uh, I'd also, from Professor Kraska, the Stockton Center and the War College, I want to thank all of the panelists, moderators, and keynote speakers who uh, donated their time and expertise for the audience. And, and I hope the audience found it insightful because that is why we gathered uh, together. Then lastly, I'd like to offer thanks on behalf of the Stockton Center to the Naval War College Foundation and Mrs. Nancy Cushing. Uh, if not for them, events like this would not be possible. And I, I uh, encourage all of you in the audience to follow us on Twitter at Stockton Center Look on our webpage, on the Stockton Center webpage, where you can learn more about other events like this uh, conference. Particularly, we're excited about a 30 June event where we will talk about the U.S. seizure of the North Korean cargo vessel Wise Honest. And in, the, in December, 
uh, we're going to have uh, our annual Law of Armed Conflict Conference, and we're excited that that will actually be in person in Newport. Again, you can find out more about those events on the Stockton Center webpage. So thank you uh, for your time. Thank you to the panelists, moderators, and speakers, and to the audience. Uh, we wish you all the best. Goodbye.